All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back from a small hiatus on the previous link. And this afternoon session, we are going to have two kind of sort of long talks. The first one is uh, all things machine learning systems, streaming data, and uh, everything. And I'm sure there's some extra surprises baked in there. So stay tuned. Um, and then after that, we'll hear about visualization, but have to get ahead of ourselves. Let's start with the systems first. So this is going to be a talk jointly delivered by Neil Lawrence, Eric, and Andre, all from the University of Cambridge. Uh, so I hand it over to you guys to start presenting. Thanks, Billy, and thanks so much for organizing. Um, I guess first we should maybe introduce my co-presenters, Eric and Andre, do you want to switch video on? Just, uh, so um, three of us presenting today on uh, machine learning systems. So Andre, uh, do you want to just introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Andre. I'm a PhD student with Neil in the University of Cambridge and uh, uh, I joined just this year. Before that, uh, I was working with Neil and Eric in uh, Amazon as a software engineer for a couple of years. And I had gained a lot of experience, both good and painful, of uh, deploying a ML in real life while doing that. Yeah, great. Thanks, Andre. Eric, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Yeah. So I'm also a PhD student, also started this year with Neil, also worked at Amazon with Neil and Andre. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, I'm interested in uh, a lot of stuff around fairness and privacy and how that relates to systems and what's missing there. Um, a lot of that I, yeah. Yeah. Worked on lots of systems at Amazon. Cool. Brilliant. And uh, just for attendees, please make use of the chat or the Q&A to ask questions as we go, or if you don't follow or don't understand, please just, uh, we're very happy to be interactive. Um, I'll make sure I post a message in the chat. Uh, well, we're, we're gonna try and multitask it. Yeah, ask questions. Thanks, uh, yeah, and Andre and Eric will be looking at those. Um, as we go. Uh, so even if you think if it's just a setup question or whatever, while um, we're going as well, uh, there's a notebook for you to follow. Uh, we won't use it at the start, but you might want to check it out. Hey, Sagan, how are you doing? Um, this is a collab notebook. So if you click on that link, you should get to uh, Jupyter notebook. You did Jupyter, I think this morning. Is that right, Billy? So you're all fully expert on Jupyter and Python? Yep, class classification and regression. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, it should all be set up. So it's running on the Google Cloud platform. Um, and so if you click on that, yeah, you should be able to, let me show you a little bit what it looks like. I'll just share briefly, and then we'll go to some slides and give some background. Uh, could attend these if you're managing to connect, it would be a great favor for me if you would just use the thumbs up. Do you know the thumbs up? So this is what you should be seeing. Um, and when you run it uh, later, it'll ask if you're happy to have permission to run it and, and you can just say yes. But if you're, if you're managing that, I don't know, is it, is it uh, maybe they can't do thumbs up. Can you do raise hand or something uh, just to sort of say that you're managing it? Five parts. seeing a lot of hands. See a lot of hands, a lot of hands. Maybe I should have said it the other way around. If you can't manage, raise your hand, because now it'd be confusing. <laughs> or just write a message. Okay, Osbert says okay. That's great. Oh, it's the same. We can't be there with you, but it's nice to connect with so many of you. Normally at DSA, the big story is to find the person who traveled the longest to get there. Uh, I guess we don't really have that uh, for the virtual DSA. Um, 
Okay, good. Um, any problems? Uh, please use the chat. Okay, Nuhu, um, he's got a problem there. Um, maybe Andre or Eric, you could just have a little chat with him. You can keep it live so that uh, other people can see what his problem was. It should just run because it's all in the cloud. So it's not relying on anything on your machine. Okay, great. So while you're sort of uh, doing some of that, I'm going to switch over and do some motivational slides for what we're trying to do today. And um, uh, yeah, yeah. Nelson Mandela, AIST, great to see you too. Um, a watch party at Arusha. Hi, Adina. Great to hear from you. Um, so I'm going to share my screen now and uh, move to some slides to give some motivation. So just some context um, on, uh, so as you heard, uh, Eric and Andre um, both used to work with me at Amazon. Um, and I was at Amazon for three years from 2016. And a major reason I was interested in going to Amazon was to understand how machine learning and data science is deployed in the real world. So. For those that don't know, Amazon's a big e-commerce company, so you can buy and sell stuff on this platform. And I'd worked a lot of time in, in, this, in academia, in machine learning, but we'd started doing data science Africa, I think in 2015, or I even visited Kampala 2013. And what we'd started to see is in these applications, uh, people had a lot of questions about how to build a full end-to-end -end machine learning. It's always the theme of Data Science Africa, end-to-end -end machine learning, which is a theme I really like. And I guess one reason I was interested in going to Amazon was to see what the answer was, <laughs> because they seem to build a lot of these things. But actually, I certainly learned a lot about some of the answers, but also some questions too. I remember, I think it was... Uh, I'm going to say it was Arusha, uh, Dina. I, I can't remember the, exactly when we were down there. And I think there was a guy called uh, Ronnie Peters in the audience uh, who, when we were giving one of the talks, he asked a question. See how the questions can inspire things three years, four years later. And his question was, well, I know how to write the app to collect the data. And I know how to analyze the data but how do I do the bit in between? And that question is we're gonna begin to answer with this session because the bit between is actually the crucial part in terms of maintaining a sustainable, explainable, safe machine learning deployment. And it's not actually that widely taught because in some sense, it's using knowledge that's spread amongst software engineers. So I very cleverly have returned to academia with Andre and Eric, who were both trained software engineers and they've worked on real world systems. And to give you a sort of sense of what I mean, if we're gonna be doing artificial intelligence, all these promises we have for what we're gonna deploy Really, I would argue is all of this is machine learning systems. And the example I'll give is one from the Amazon supply chain. So let me say a little bit is what is Amazon, what is supply chain? So I had a colleague at Amazon whose picture we'll see in a moment called the Ryan. And uh, he was originally from India in Kerala and he used to tell a story of, uh, no, he was actually from Bombay, but he used to tell a story of a guy in Kerala. So Kerala is a state in the South of India and in South of India, they have a lot of coconuts and there's a lot of rivers in Kerala. Um, it's where they filmed, I think, Apocalypse Now. If you've ever seen that film, it's an old film now. But uh, he said that there's a guy in uh, Kerala who, has, who sits underneath a coconut tree and whenever a boat comes along, he sells coconuts. And if he runs out of coconuts, he climbs the tree and gets another coconut. And Narayan then used to say that this guy has the support, shortest supply chain in the world. 
So what does he mean by that? Of course, the guy's only having to climb the tree to get his produce. But then Narayan used to say is the magic of real supply chain is making everything seem like it's on a tree above the guy who's selling it. So whatever you're buying, whether it's a cassava or a knife or a pot or a car, you give people the impression that it's instantly available. Even though these things take time to grow, they take time to manufacture. And this is the art of supply chain. So these two people here, th these have been in different times, the boss of the Amazon supply chain, this guy is called Lou Mason, this guy is called Devesh Mishra, and they manage and run the Amazon supply chain. And what this game involves is it involves trying to understand what people want. So what we would call uh, a demand forecast, trying to make a forecast about what people want to buy and also trying to understand where it's available and how long it takes to get them. And then trying to match these two things to form your stock. So what Lou and then later and currently Devesh were in charge of is trying to understand how much stock to store in Amazon warehouses in order to match supply and demand and make things readily available. That's also affected by the cost, how much you can buy and sell for. And one of the things about Amazon is this is all automated. So people do this all the time, whether they're market traders, um, whether they're running a farm, if they've got a garden, in the garden they're working out how much fertilizer they need and they keep a stock to make sure it's always available. So they're all doing this all the time. But the scale and size over which Amazon's doing this, in terms of hundreds of millions of items they sell in their stock, means that they, they don't have individual people to worry about this. They do it all automated. Everything's automated. So it's all done using machine learning algorithms. Now, what I would argue is a system like this, it could be, I don't really know what AI is. I don't think of AI as Terminator robots or whatever else. I think of it as automated decision making. And automated decision making by machine learning algorithms. So under that definition, given the amount of money that Amazon spends per year on buying things, my argument is that this is probably the world's largest AI. Uh, are we together on that? Any questions? I don't see any questions yet. I can't quite see the chat thing at the moment because I'm sharing. But is there anything in the chat? Or more, 10, chat 10. Is that just uh, sorting out the... Uh, yeah, we're just sorting out loading questions. I don't see out any loading for questions. the talk. Okay. Ah, so Jason, you have a raised hand. Do you have a question? Could we, uh, uh, could we, Jason, if you've got a question, put, uh, put it in the chat or the Q&A and we'll try and address it. Or are you just looking for help? Okay, I'll carry on. I'm assuming we're together. Okay. Right, so this is a classical modern AI system, right? And of the type that a lot of big tech companies put together. It, it requires a lot of people. So these are some people, friends and ex-colleagues of uh, mine and Andre and Eric. This is Jenny Freshwater. She runs the team that forecasts how much people want, the demand, demand forecasting team. There's a big team for demanding forecasts. Ping is a director in the team. Jenny's vice president. Ping is a director of applied science. She runs a big science team to do their forecasting. Hundreds of millions of items, what the demand will be, how much people will want. And Dean is a senior scientist in the team. These are all people just on the forecasting. So actually, Eric and Andre and I were in a different team, what was called inventory and buying. And these are some of the people from this team. This was Deepak, who after Devesh was my boss, Deepak became my boss. This is Piyush. Piyush uh, ran one part of the team that dealt with people who weren't Amazon because they sell third party things on the platform. Piyush dealt with that. And these are two of my favorite scientists. Salal is an operations research expert. 
And Narayan is the guy who would tell the story of the coconut. The man selling coconuts, he's a supply chain expert. So all these people involved, and I, you know, I'm not allowed to even say, uh, not even allowed to say uh, how many people, but it's hundreds of people running the automated supply chain. So it's automated, but there's lots and lots of people keeping it running behind the scenes. Okie dokie. Um, so what does that mean for us? Well, I want to tell another little story about Amazon. These are two different people. So this is Charlie Bell on the left. Charlie Bell is uh, currently, he's the AWS, he's the most senior technical person in the world. So he's like the most important engineer in Amazon. And this is Peter Voschel, who, who recently left, but uh, he was a very senior engineer. Now, what I've tried to draw here is some of the different components to the Amazon supply chain. We saw Jenny's team, they have to do demand forecast. And the team which Deepak led, we had to do supply forecast, try and predict how long it will take to get. So if we order, you know, imagine ordering cassava and you're in Kampala and you need more cassava, how long does it take to get it? Or if you're in Lagos, how long does it take to get more cassava? So forecasting that, how long it will take, because that helps you know when to order. And also predicting how much money you can make. This is important too. And then another team for making the purchase orders. So once you predict how much you want, automatically making the order for the goods. So this is the type of thing we want to do with machine learning automatically. But here I've drawn it all in one box. But what Peter did a long time ago, 15 years ago, he was part of a team that was uh, redesigning the Amazon website. They weren't in supply chain. They were working on the website. And Peter built a system that took what I've drawn here, which is called a monolithic system, and split it into parts. So I'm redrawing it now like this. So instead of one piece of software, one big piece of software, Peter said, okay, we're gonna split these pieces into different parts and we're gonna have them interact. So we'll have one team, a small team. Okay, it's not small now. But at one time it was a small team that makes the demand forecast. So we'll have six people doing this bit and another team, a small team, six people doing the supply forecast, another team doing the cost predictions and another team handling the system that does the purchase order. <clears throat> and this is what's known as service oriented architecture. So this is the foundation of cloud computing because at that time when Peter was designing this, Charlie was actually in charge of the website trying to keep the old system running. And it was very, very hard because there's too much, too many people, too many systems, software too complex. And then Peter did the redesign and this made it simpler to build and scale the website. So the scaling is very important. For a machine learning system, it's nice for using with you and your friends. You don't have to worry about scale. But if the whole of Lagos which is I think 20 million people, decides to use your system, you may find you have a problem if you didn't worry about the scale. So what Peter did is he designed this thing called service-oriented architecture with other people, and they redid the Amazon website like that. And today, everything in Amazon is done like this. So everything is built in such a way that you have a small team owning what they call a service. Each of these is a service and the services interact. They call each other through web interfaces. Okay. Are we together? Are there any questions on that in the chat or the Q&A? Any questions? I'll check with Eric and Andre. No, the, 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 no, there are no specific questions to this part yet. So carry okay, on. Good. I'll carry on. So what does this mean for DSA? What's this got to do with you? This is Amazon. Okay, well, here's the thing. This is uh, one of the vice presidents of DSA, we might think of him. Uh, several of you will know him. This is Anes Mboise. 
and uh, with many of you may be on the call, Ernest has been working on mobile monitoring of crop disease. So he has a website here. I think if I click, oh, I can't click on it at the moment. But this website is the McCarray AI Research Group. And the idea is to build mobile phone apps to monitor disease in cassava. So uh, Ernest and the team in the AI group in McCarray, they built a system where the farmer in his garden, he can take a photo of the cassava leaf and it will count the white fly. So I think cassava mosaic disease is an example of a disease that's spread by white fly. So he can, the farmer can quickly give an assessment to the Ministry of Agriculture how much white fly he has on the crops. Um, This is Martin. I think Martin's on the call. So Martin, uh, actually, we worked a little bit with Martin on this. Martin's at UN Global Pulse. He's trying to build systems, spatial temporal models for biosurveillance. So the work we did was trying to understand where disease is and where it's moving. So very important, obviously, for COVID, but also important uh, at the time, I think, these type of systems uh, were used to monitor typhoid outbreaks. So you know where to send the drugs. You know where to send um, the malaria drugs, you know where to send the uh, typhoid drugs, and you can stop the outbreak. And of course, the same now with COVID. Uh, and that's true internationally. So that's a, a project Martin's involved in. And then Maureen, community radio. So trying to, the community radio project, again, out of UN, UN Global Pulse that Maureen's involved in, is trying to acquire data about uh, from radio across Uganda, from community radio, where people may be talking about problems, hospitals, floods, disease. Try and understand when problems are developing by listening to the radio. So people telephone the radio and they, they talk about their problems. And in this project, they try and use speech recognition to translate that. Um, supply chain. There's the Kudu project that's come out of the AI group in McCarray, which is trying to match people who have produce to sell, motoke or cassava or whatever, and want to find a market who will buy it. And the idea here is that they use their mobile phone to find a buyer. Uh, and then they know where to drive. So if you live, I guess, as you know, down here in West Uganda, you don't want to drive seven hours to Kampala to find no one cares about what's in your truck. You can drive somewhere else locally. So the idea here is you have a system for doing that. Now that's a supply chain system. Um, and then final, I've never met these folks, but uh, this is, uh, I think this is originally out of Kampala because I guess it's calling itself safe border, but uh, it's also in Nigeria, I think. Um, this ride sharing company or company, I don't know if it's a company or a group, but it's an app where you can get and uh, you can order a border. And I, when you order a border border on, on the app, you get a driver who has this nice orange shirt and is conforming to some safety. I think they have a helmet for you. I haven't used it or actually even seen it, but I really like the idea. And you can see that this is a system, a machine learning system. So in order to do this well, you want to know where the drivers are. You have to make predictions. Okay, so those are the introductory slides. But the main point about all of these systems is there's data moving in each of them. And the data needs to be stored somewhere. And the data needs to be accessed. And when you look at the scale of what Peter and uh, Charlie have been doing with Amazon, you're dealing with hundreds of millions of people as your customers at any given time. And you need to build systems that can tolerate that. And the problem we face in the African context is Ernest doesn't have an enormous amount of time to be doing all this work and to be maintaining all these things. So we don't have to just know about the machine learning and the apps. We have to know about what we might call the data infrastructure, this plumbing system here. So you can think of it as plumbing because data is just moving around between these services. 
so the idea of today's session is to start introducing you to some of the concepts behind such a structure by looking at databases. So we're going to look um, at one of the first things you might think to do. If you, one of the things I think we really all want DSA to be doing is people to be building their own startups, to have their own ideas and to build startups that do useful things. But those useful things need to have robust infrastructure. So you need something solid behind it. And today's session is really an introduction to what that kind of infrastructure looks like. Let me stop there and we'll, um, I'm going to stop sharing and we'll see if Neil, there's any questions. Neil, yeah, maybe the, maybe you could answer this slide for, uh, rather than me typing in. Uh, but could you explain a bit more of what could be a machine learning task and save border apps? Oh, that's a great question, Abdallah. So in a safe border app, uh, actually, we have to check, maybe Abdallah works for them. I don't know in safe border themselves, but the things you can imagine in ride sharing is um, you might want to have when you open the app, so you, you get your app out. If I open the Uber app on uh, my phone, let's see if I've got Uber available. Uh, so I'm opening the Uber app now. Okay, and the first thing that comes up is a map of where I am. And it gives me, it, it starts telling me where there are cars nearby. So, um, I don't know if you can see there, but on here, it tells me a time. It says how long I might want to wait to get the car. So how long will it take if I order the Uber for the Uber to arrive? Okay, now this is a machine learning algorithm already. So that one thing of how much time it's going to take for the Uber to arrive, if I order it, I don't want to order it because apparently I'm ordering a Uber to go to the to London, which is quite expensive from Cambridge. Um, but they have to make a prediction about how long it will arrive. And they don't know that. How can they know how long it's gonna take? You know, the car might crash. Um, there might be a lot more traffic than they expect. So that prediction is based on previous data. So they have the data in the system about how long it takes the cars to move around where I am, which is Cambridge. So you've got all data. So the same thing with Safe Border. So imagine you're at the campus in the center of Kampala um, at the university and you want to order a border, right? Actually, they're right outside the gate, so it'll take no time. So that's not a good example. Maybe you're on Akibua High Road in Kampala and there's no borders nearby and you open the Safe Border app. I don't know if it does this or not, but it could predict how long it will take for a safe border to arrive. And that prediction would be based on the machine learning algorithm. Um, yep, great. So, and actually this comes up a lot. So one of the things we see, Abdallah, in modern software is where people used to put classical software systems, like write a program, you'll often find a little bit of machine learning, trying to use data to infer it. Other questions? Okay, should we go to the notebook. Okay, I'm gonna try and paste this right. It's gonna be very hard. It's, it's so much easier when we're in the same room together. Um, to go through these notebooks properly. Um, and it's you know a little bit hard, I think, when we're all remote from you. Also, I don't get to directly see the chat. Okay, so we've written this notebook, which is gonna introduce some of the ideas. Um, now, this is the big principle behind what we're doing. The machine learning is about a model and combining that model with data. Use a computer, use the algorithm to make a prediction. Model plus data through compute leads to prediction. Now, so many courses will focus on the model part. Talk a lot and lot and lot about neural network or 
logistic regression or some algorithm. But in reality, the most important part is the data. Without data, you can do nothing. And if we're doing real work, if we're not just playing with machine learning, if we're interested in building a real system, we have to care very much about how we're bringing our data together, what the data quality is, what the data availability is, what the data freshness is, is the data up to date. So in today's notebook, we're gonna look at some data from Nigeria. Uh, it's actually health data. So in previous workshops, I've used the NMIFS health facility data. And this is a notebook that uh, Eric has put together where we've combined this data, which is, it's available on various sites. It's also, someone's put it on Kaggle too, with other information that we might find useful. So population data for Nigerian states, other information, map boundaries for Nigerian states. So this data contains the health facilities across Nigeria from some date all the health facilities and the location of each facility in terms of the GPS, the latitude, longitude, the number of doctors at that facility, the number of nurses at that facility, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of information. But what we might be interested in is making predictions about that. So we might want to know what state those facilities are in. So Eric has got the map data for the Nigerian states. And right today, we might be interested in COVID cases. Any other time, maybe interested in malaria. Well, we're always interested in malaria, typhoid cases. We might be interested in whether we have enough medicine in an area, making decisions about that. But this data is just another example. We can see where we might use machine learning because we have current data and we might be forecasting the future data. That's what everyone's doing in the UK with COVID data at the moment. But you can just think of this as a safe border as well. So in the safe border example, you have the, the borders or what is it in, um, in Nigeria, you call them Okada, right? I think. Um, Actually, and I want other people to give all the names of border borders in the chat now. So if you don't call it border border, or if I've got a card wrong, just to show you're awake, put in the chat what the local name is for a border border. Um, no one knows. <laughs> no one knows their local name for border border. That's bad. So in the border example, you might be interested in every border border would have a, a jaj, a moto, a nice, a kada. A kada, that's good. Uh, I like, so I read something that a kada was originally an airline and that because the border border go in and out of the traffic like that, I guess, that they named the, they started calling it after an airline, which I thought was pretty cool. So um, the motorbike taxi, you might want to know where it is in the town. So you might have boundaries, districts in the town. Um, and each of those districts, you might want to say, well, which district is the border border in? Just like you want to know where the health center is, which part of Nigeria is it in? So for each of those things, you need to understand the GPS location and you may need to know the location of your districts. So that's something we're going to look at in this notebook. We're going to do it all in Python. Um, now, I think if you were really doing this for real, you wouldn't, in your background systems, the systems you were building, you wouldn't necessarily be using Python. Actually, can anyone put in the chat what type of languages you might build such systems in? What would be more common to build such a system? I'm going to talk to Eric and Andre about how they used to build it as well. Any guesses in the chat? I'll give you a clue. It's not MATLAB. 
Oh, ah, everyone's doing it. Uh, John does it in Python. Good heavens, John. Well, I'm glad you're all converted. Look at that, Osbert, thank you. Java. So that's a great one. Abdallah's mentioning Keras. Okay, so that, that's nice to bring that up actually, because going back to the slides, where would Keras be? I'm gonna switch, gonna stop the sharing. Eric, where, um, in this diagram, where would we put Keras? What, what sort of parts do we think where we might find Keras? I don't see a diagram, Neil. Oh, you we don't can see, see your whole screen. Oh, damn it. See all the weird <laughs> things I've been writing about you. <laughs> Desktop two, let's try that again. There we go, is that better? So uh, where we might we use Keras? So this sort of uh, thing I'm talking about is really the links, right? Where would you use Keras here, Eric? Keras would be inside of these orange um, spaces. So anywhere you are making a forecast or a prediction, uh, right? It's a, it's a library for doing neural networks. Um, and it's, it doesn't handle things like data or how they move around or the infrastructure. Um, so that would, there would be individual little Keras um, modules inside of each of these forecasts and predictions or not, or you could use anything else. They're, they're not coupled together um, between these. Uh, the demand forecast could, could use, use Keras, my forecast could use PyTorch. PyKitLearn or PyTorch or. Yeah. Um, I guess Keras, for those who don't know Keras, Keras is a, a sort of wrapper framework that will uh, wrap around mainly TensorFlow, but I think you can use PyTorch for it as well, right? I think I'm so. I'm not sure what the latest is. Yeah. Other people on the on the talk would know better. Um, so yeah, but it's great to mention Keras. A lot of I, what Amazon basically uses is Java. Or if you're not using Java, there's another language that's quite related. What it might be? Scala. Look at Billy, top of the class. <laughs> Yeah, so I guess, um, I guess, go ahead. I, I guess it's, um, it's a, it, it, we, we could say here is that Python has like been the uh, center of the schools that we're doing right now is a, is great for data science and gained a lot of popularity. But what we're talking about here is um, some way of piping data to where you are, you know, where you, to the point where you have a data set and you're comfortable doing machine learning and exploring with these visualizations, all this kind of stuff. So this is just pure systems engineering, which is normally done, like you could do it in, in Python all the way through, but yeah, normally these days you, you, you would find it done in things like Ruby or maybe Java or maybe even C++. Um, so why don't we do it fair, in like, Python? Sorry, Andre. Yeah, why don't we use Python, Andre? Yeah, what are the? But, but like we could it just the language matters as much as the as the, as the libraries behind it, and so Python and R are very strong on the things that people have done to do great data science. Right, Java is strong for the systems engineering that people have done with it. Um, so it's basically, but, but there are, but if John decides to do it all the way in Python, he will probably succeed. Um, yeah, it's a couple of comments. Osbert's mentioning C++. So you could in C++, Osbert, I guess. So at one point, Amazon was entirely Java. And the reason that C++ is a little bit trickier is, of course, it's sort of harder to program robustly. You have to you can make more mistakes in C++, but it's a good systems language. Um, yeah, and as you said, Python is not great for enterprise applications. And I think it's part of what uh, Andre was saying is it's the ecosystem. People have written a lot of libraries um, in Java for this type of system stuff. So, so the um, Peter Voschel would have written everything he did for the Amazon website in Java. 
Uh, but the Java runs on the JVM. So that's why Scala is sort of very important. So the JVM is a, a virtual machine that runs Java code. And as Billy mentioned, Scala, Scala is like a functional programming language that runs on the JVM. So a lot of modern machine learning systems infrastructure is actually written in Scala because it turns out that functional programming is a very good paradigm, a good programming paradigm for this type of data systems streaming work. So Scala is very popular. And then you'll also find data science frameworks such as Spark Streaming that are based around Scala. But yeah, Python is fantastic. We love Python because it's, um, it's kind of a good compromise language. So it, it can do some of these things. I, I, Shell Karaoke isn't on the call, is she? So I can say rude things about R when Shell's not on the call. <laughs> we have a thing between us about R. But um, R is a great language for data science, but R is very difficult for this, this type of thing. So again, we might, um, if you, the sort of thing people are trying to do nowadays with a machine learning system is, just going back to this, sometimes, although it's a bit of an extreme architecture and I wouldn't personally recommend it, you might put R inside here, like you put Keras inside here. You might run a Docker container or Python again. So you might have something inside here that's a Docker container. Docker is quite widely used for this sort of thing. Um, and then be running Python in here, but your infrastructure around you tends to be run on Java. So there's an amount of what's called wrapping that goes on and Docker is one way to wrap a Python application. Let me just check that with real software engineers. Have I got that right, Eric and Andre? Seems legit. Yep. That's one way of going about it. There's lots of different. I just want to check with Eric and Andre if you feel slightly ill when I say that you can put R in here and wrap it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, see software yeah, engineers yeah, feels yeah, absolutely feels I'm, slightly I'm, I, I, I'm 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 grateful that you didn't say my pub. <laughs> And this is one challenge. So these frameworks are really good for data science. A lot of what we're doing is data science, but you, you make software engineers feel ill if you say that you want to. Uh, so what they'll very often do, and this used to happen at Amazon a lot, people, software engineers would rewrite the algorithm in Java. It used to happen an enormous amount. It's very inefficient because you do all your data science work and then the software engineers would then rewrite it in Java to bring it in the system. Today, um, and in fact, one of the things Eric did while he was at Amazon was he made it so that we could uh, ship. It was Python code. I'm not going to go into the details of how he did it, but he built a system so that we could ship Python directly in these systems. That'd be roughly right, Eric, with MX Fusion, right? Yeah, I would say so. There's a productionization of it. Productionization of ML. Okay. Back to the notebook. Well, any questions actually there? Let's just pause and take more questions. As always, it's like the right programming language for the right task. There's no single correct programming language. I've got two hands up from Quasi and Humphrey. Does that mean you wanted to ask something or have you just forgotten and left your hands up? Oh, hands gone down from Quasi. Humphrey, Humphrey, hands still up. Do feel free to write something. Okay, cool. Right, let's get back to the notebook then if everyone's, we're together, I think we're together. The numbers are increasing. That's the only thing, you, the only feedback you can tell is the number of participants. We're at 82. Um, okay, because it starts dropping below 50, I'll know to shut up. Um, have I got that right? Yeah, you can all see the notebook again, yeah? So having said that and talked a lot about languages, it's absolutely fine to start playing with this stuff in Python. And uh, we're just trying to give you the idea of it. So we're gonna do stuff in Python today. Um, I think when we have time, Eric will, Eric is your streaming is a bit in Java, right? Uh, no, I actually got the streaming stuff to work in Python. Great. So we had a yeah. bit of a headache getting streaming stuff to work in Python, but Eric managed it. It was potential he was going to have to do it in Java. Yeah. So databases and joins. So the main idea we're actually going to be looking at today. 
So we, we, we're going to, the notebook, so if you're at this point, just run this bit here, right? Because this will install a couple of, um, so you're going to get this notice. The, go, the notebook's been loaded from GitHub. Just click run anyway. Um, I've already pre-installed these, so it says requirements already satisfied, but you will get it downloading. So this is a cool thing in a notebook, by the way. If you do this Python magic command pip install, you can download some libraries that you might need. And we're going to use GeoPandas and PyGeos. These are useful libraries anyway, just for dealing with mapping data. So I don't know if John's this year going to be doing his spatial data talk. And I don't know if he uses GeoPandas, but he probably does. You can say in the chat. Um, OK, but the main idea we're going to be working with today, the concept we want to get across is the notion of a database join. Because uh, a join is crucial to many of the things we want to do. And in some sense, it's, quite, it's not super complicated. But it's vital for doing these type of machine learning systems. And a join does exactly what it says. So I, this should say it combines two database tables. A join combines two database tables. Or in pandas, I think you learned pandas this morning and you reviewed data frames, it can be used for joining two data frames. And we're going to do both. So you've been looking at pandas, which is a great way of storing and structuring data. It's a great way, in fact, you know, to speak up for R, it's entirely stolen from R. And, I, and everyone who works with it in R says the data frames in R are much, much better. So you can see it's horses for courses, that not, um, not one language to rule them all. But the idea of pandas is taken from R, and it's a notion of data frames. But that idea itself is actually taken from databases. So we're going to go sort of more fundamental and look at the database. So it's a really great tool for the data scientist because it makes many operations easier. So looking at particular parts of your data, and it also makes them less buggy. As we'll see, the C as we go down, instead of using indexes that you have to do in C, C++, some of these other languages, Java, you get to refer to parts of your data structure by a column name or an index. And that makes sure it's helpful when you're trying to not have bugs. Also, you get to do things like joins in this. So John builds his systems in Python. He may even use pandas. Um, but the problem for John would have, see, I'm going to pick on John here. Sorry, John. John can build that, and he can build that. And if just everyone in this lecture theater uses his system, then it's OK. It's not really a problem. He can write some Python scripts. They can run some basic services. He can store data in text files on his server. This isn't a problem. But what if your system's successful? So what if, like SafeBorder, you become a successful ride-sharing system? Now, there are 1.5 million people in Kampala. And I looked it up, and it said there were 100,000 Boda Boda drivers. This is a lot, right? I think I, I know there are a lot, but that, that, that even that sounds a lot. OK, so maybe you're successful in Kampala, and maybe you can manage this. Because maybe there's 1.5 million, but not everyone's, not every border border is on your system. So maybe you have 20,000. Well, what if you're even more successful? What if everyone in Lagos wants your system? So there's around 20 million people in Lagos. And I was just trying to do the numbers. I don't know. I couldn't find a number for Arcada drivers in Lagos, how many there are. But if the ratio was the same, so 1.5 million people um, to 100,000 border drivers, that's a pretty big ratio. So like, that's normally like 7% of the population of Kampala are border border drivers. That's why it sounds so, so big. If we do the same thing here, 7% of the people in Lagos, if they're border border drivers, I don't think they can be because that would be as many border border drivers in Lagos as there are people in Kampala, right? It's about 1.5 million which would be an extraordinary number of uh, Akata drivers. And I was reading online that they're, they're being banned and stuff. But imagine, imagine there are that many. Or imagine you're doing something at the scale of Amazon. So now the sort of piece it together with Python and Pandas approach becomes a little bit, um, a little bit problematic. And uh, I was reminded of, uh, uh, so this is, this is my mental image. So this is what it starts to look like when you are trying to use Python 
to transport too much of a load. You know, it's very innovative. It can be quite clever even. Um, very impressive. These six children going to school on uh, one border border. But it's, it's not safe. It's not reliable. And it's not the way to scale your business. So this is the mental idea. This is what you're going to end up with. Because by an analogy, it's like you're trying to move too big a load on a motorbike. That's my idea for what it would happen if you didn't think carefully about your systems design. So um, I'm going to check the chat here, see how annoyed John's getting with me commenting on his machine learning systems in this way. Yeah, we've got some nice comments from Eric on that. Ha, ah, okay, one thought, this is from John. Quite a bit of the development of Google seems to be in Python. Yes, yes, that's right. Actually, it's an interesting thing that Google's coding itself, they do not use service-oriented architecture. Um, but my personal feeling is that, well, most companies do. The reason Google don't, I think, is because they're very, they've been coding in this particular way since the beginning. So they have these, as John says, they use uh, MapReduce and various things. Um, but most people now do use service-oriented architecture. And the reason for that is something we'll come to in a little bit, but just about to talk about. So I think the Google approach to coding is, um, is unusual. Um, and it's true that because they have one shared code base for the whole company and all these interesting things. Um, but I think most companies are a little bit more like the way Amazon does stuff. Okay, so, so to build a reliable system, you no longer use things like pandas, you use things like databases. And we're gonna be focusing on SQL databases, which is one of the earliest databases. And to bring two different streams of data together, uh, you need to do a join of these databases. Yeah, definitely, Osbert, you definitely can blend languages and platforms together using APIs. And in fact, um, just going back to, uh, let's see, I'll just pull, that, that's kind of what we're I'm trying to keep. Bear with me for a second. Probably just clicked leave instead of share screen and yeah. All right. Well, while while here in joins, let me let me take that. So uh, yeah. So that like like Neil said that that's exactly right, Oliver. The the point of service oriented architecture. One of the points of service oriented architecture, besides scalability, is that you hide the particular platform you use to implement something. Uh, behind the API. An API doesn't have, you know, uh, it, 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 it doesn't even care what's behind it. It could be Python, Java, C++, R, whatever, right? And so one of the points of service-oriented architectures is that you can have one service implemented Python, and as implemented Java, they can talk, and that there will be no problems there. Another thing that you can imagine is um, maybe something we'll touch in the end is, Service-oriented architecture is not the only way to separate things out and just call in APIs. And we'll have a chat probably towards the end of the session of um, uh, something we call, would like to call data-oriented architectures. And that would be a completely different way of doing the same thing, which is also kind of, um, we, the kind of a way of, uh, you know, Martin, can you promote me to co-host again? Sorry, I dropped out, came back in. Okay, cool. Yeah, I think as Andre was saying, you know what I did then, I'm such a total klutz. I was trying to stop sharing and instead of that, I clicked leave because the leave button was red and stop sharing is also red. What a class. Yeah, as, as Andre was just saying, as he smoothly filled in for me. Um, yeah, each of these within, the, you build APIs. So the way this tends to interact is each of these services has an API, which is often like a, what are they called? REST APIs, um, Andre? Yeah. Yeah, so, so you, 
you, you define a REST API on each of these services and behind that API, which is, is made by a Java call between the services, all sorts of stuff could be going on. You could have C++, you can have Python, you can have anything that's going on. And in fact, the, the flexibility of that is, is one challenge we have for machine learning systems. When um, Andre mentions data-oriented architectures, that's something we're actively trying to research to sort of fix that. But yeah, as John says, uh, Google don't do it in that way. And I don't, you know, John would know more about that. Let's see if I can stop sharing without leaving the call. Yay, success. Um, so yeah, and, and actually, you know, it's quite nice. The, the thing John describes of being able to um, uh, just code in whatever you like and have the engineers handle it for you is the ideal. That's what we would like to have, but you do not have that. Unless you work for Google, you do not have that. You are going to have to build that yourself. So it would be the ideal that everyone just programs in the thing that they want to program in. And, you know, we would love to get there, but we're not there. We're not there by any stretch of the imagination. So in the meantime, you have to put a lot of thought when you're building these systems into how you're doing this so that you make it scalable. Because if you don't make it scalable, if it's successful, you have to rebuild it all from scratch. Okay. Uh, let's get back to this. Okay. So that's the sort of motivation for why we're trying to do this. Now we're going to go into um, uh, downloading some data. So th these commands in Python, if you just run them, they are just to download um, uh, from this source, this uh, hospital data. Now, whenever you download data, the first thing you should always do is take a little look at the data. So that's what we're doing here. So we've downloaded it into a data frame just to, um, What's going on here? This is a URL request. So this is just giving a web request to the file. If you go all the way to the end of this file, you just see it's a CSV file. Yeah. And that is being downloaded into the local directory. And then we're loading that in through a PD read command. So that's a pandas read. So we've imported pandas as PD and we're reading the CSV that's giving us a pandas data structure. And that's called hospital data. So these, I mean, we say hospital, these are really health centers. So some of them aren't, uh, are, are quite small. And then we can have a look at what's in this data. So if we do hospital data dot head, then you're going to see the columns and the first five entries. So it gives you the facility name, gives you the facility type, and then it gives you some of the facilities. So birth delivery, emergency transport. Do they have a skilled birth assistant? Um, oh, I can't remember what Choose is. It's something health, care, health, something. It's a particular type of healthcare worker, I think. People in the chat, someone put that in the chat, please, because someone will know. I know they will what a Choose is. Number of nurses, number of midwives, number of doctors. Very useful information. Um, but look at this. Wow, the community is interesting. The ward, you know, this is in capitals, this is in smalls. This could turn out to be a problem. Do they have a approved water supply, sanitation, vaccines, freezer, so on and so forth. Super useful information. And then at the end, we have this nice thing, the latitude and longitude of the hospital. So if we look at, so we've got the location as well. So, I mean, I've just scrolled through those, but of course in pandas, we can just ask to show the data columns. So here I'm doing hospital data columns and you can see the different columns that are in there. So the, that's the one I was highlighting, the latitude and longitude. Whenever you get a data set, it's always a pretty good idea to start plotting it. And a very sensible thing to do here would seem to be just plot the latitude against the longitude. And what we do is we see an outline of Nigeria. Yeah. So I think, uh, am I getting this right? This would be about Lagos. Would that be Abuja? I'm not sure. But Lagos is here, is it? Abuja here. So you start to see the way Eric's plotted this is he's used alpha is equal to 0 0.01. Now that means that the points are transparent. So look up here where there's less people, you see a very faint red circle. What you see going on in the city locations is lots of faint red circles plotted on top of each other, start leading to a big fat red mass. So you can see there's a lot of health centers. So that's a nice way 
a nice trick Eric's used of letting us visualize. If we were to just plot without this, so let's see what happens if we plot without this, it's much harder to see what's going on. Anyone spot Lagos now? No. Yeah. Visualization, totally key in data science, right? So this gives us some sanity check that we're getting roughly the right shape of the country. Okay. But this is problematic because if we look at the original data, what we can see is there's some information about these, the states where these places are, but it, it looks like the information is a bit, uh, where was it? I don't know, some of it's in capitals, Ehom Central community, I, you know, this is, we're not really got the state information. So what Eric did is he went to this place, the Humanitarian Data Exchange. And this has a lot of data about administrative regions. So we searched for the, he searched for data on here and he found data um, which is going to give us the state borders. So that's what we're going to download now. So he's downloading it from the humanitarian data exchange. So this is a different data set. So this is data set two. Now, in our mocked example, what we're doing here is just downloading these from the web, right? But Effectively, our download from the web. Hey, Charles, you, you uh, unmuted. Charles, oh, you just joined in us. Yes, I, I, I totally got the, the timing wrong. No, that's all right. But I wanted you to be here because check me out. Okay. I've got the, <laughs> That's African University Science and Technology. This is Charles's fabricated. I, I wore it specially for you today, Charles. So I'm glad you're in. Um, do you want to just mute? Thanks, Charles. All right. Um, okay, so remember this diagram. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep swapping over to this now. Um, but the other diagram here, we're mocking this up. We haven't built a real system because, of course, real systems are difficult to get hold of. But it's a little bit like the, uh, whatever we're doing here is calling data. It's calling data from... So we've got some system here that's saying, I need to get data from somewhere else. And so online, they've got this hospital's data. And the first thing we're doing is calling that hospital's data together. And then in this space, we've got the hospital's data. Maybe we would do something with that, maybe not. But then after that, we're also calling in another data set, which isn't shown as a line here. And that other data set is this humanitarian data exchange. So while these are not done as a REST API, they could be. They could be, right? How are we getting the data? We're just using um, the URL. We're using this, you know, we're just making a web request, right? Um, which is a very simple way of getting data. In a more sophisticated system, you would be doing this with a REST API and you would, I want the updated version of these data sets. I pull one data set in, I pull the other data set in, and then we're gonna join. Now the join we're gonna do is special because what we have now is this new data set. It's got the outline of every different state in Nigeria. See, I'm doing all this Nigeria stuff for you, Charles, you know. Um, so every state in Nigeria, and what we really wanna know is which health facilities are in which state. Now this is an odd type of join because we've got the outlines of the states of Nigeria and we're gonna sort of show you that down here. So Neil, we're still on your slides, by the way. Oh yeah. I'm gonna switch to the notebook, thanks. Oh, thank you. Uh, yes. Oh, I'll try and switch with that. Uh, thanks for highlighting that. Community health extension workers. Thank you. I knew someone would know. The uh, thank you, Joyce community health worker and community health extension worker. Thank you, Seku and Joyce. Brilliant. So this new data is interesting because this new data is very specific, but extremely useful, certainly in the African context, where very often you're looking at geospatial data. So geospatial data, data that's distributed on maps. And Python has some libraries for dealing with that. So Geopandas is a sort of pandas-like library that is designed specifically for working with um, geospatial data. 
So what you're going to see us do here, so we downloaded, what have we got? We downloaded and extracted uh, this database. This GDB is a special type of database that includes mapping information. So it's another database, but it's a special one that includes mapping information. And we're going to actually deal with it with GPD. Notice that's not GDB, that's GPD, GeoPandas versus, I think that stands for Geographical Database, right? So what we're going to do, first of all, is we're going to convert that hospital data that we uploaded earlier into a data frame, a geo data frame, yeah, from GDB, a GD, GPD, <laughs> GPD. Um, so gpd.geodataframe is just taking the hospital data and it's what Eric's done is he specified what the geometry is. So because it's, because it's a geographic data, there's a special way of representing the geography. And Eric's using a little command to map from that special way of representing the geography uh, from the latitude and longitude to a set of points represented from the geography. So that's what he's doing here, right? And that's a particular new going to be a new column in this new data frame which is a geo data frame called geometry that's what this command means and just on a technical point this is there's, there's lots of different ways of doing, doing geo referencing and this is just specifying what the way we're using this is a standard coordinate system of lang not langitude and long not, 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 latitude and longitude okay great so we're going to do your first join is going to be a special join. Let me just run those cells. You run them yourself. But you, the first join you're going to do is a, is a special join. Because what we're going to do is join these hospital locations with the state locations. So it's an unusual join. But first of all, to try and get an idea of what's going on there, we're going to just look at those state locations. So this is the what we downloaded before with the zip file. It's the GDB file, but all this stuff is like, meaning Nigeria, administrative region, something, 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 I don't know, dot GDB, right? So it's, a, it's the, the folder which is in storing the Nigerian states. So Eric's called that the states file. And if you run that, those lines of code, what they basically do is they load that in and then they plot We've got two plots coming in here, right? So the base plot is, um, this is the Nigerian states. And then we're also adding to that um, the uh, locations of the hospitals. But now look how much nicer things are. You're getting a clear idea of where the state boundaries are, which is falling with this. So this must be what, the FCT, Federal Capital Territory or something like that, or is it that one, one of those two? This is the sort of 20 million people that they got that we're sort of seeing emerging here. And then just for Charles, I have to mention Abuja. I don't know whether it's that one or that one. It's, or it's, it's definitely central, isn't it? But yeah. Okay. So we're gonna perform what's called a spatial join. So you can see, we've got two data sets we've displayed here in different ways. One of these data sets is the states. And one of these data sets is the points that were located the health centers. And the reason this join is special, normally we would just join on names or something. So we'd have two data sets where like one is saying, oh, this is where Neil goes to school or this is where Neil works. And another one is saying, this is where Neil lives, right? So we could have two databases. Imagine we have two databases for everyone in this uh, Zoom call. One of the databases stores your home address and one of your databases stores your work address. And we want a new database that stores your home address and your work address. Okay, in that case, you join on the key, which is our names. So you key things on our names or some, actually it would be more sensible to have a unique identity for each of us, to be honest. That's why you have things like NHS numbers. But imagine we don't have the key here, we can think of as being our identity, which we'll think of as being our name. And you join those two databases and you end up with a single database, which has the home and workplace together. Okay, now this is a slightly unusual join because 
it's going to geometric join in that we're going to join places together if they sit within the state. So the identity is map these points to the state that they're sitting in. So these points here, if this is FCT, would be in the federal capital territory. I don't know what the name of this state is, but these points here would, would sit in this state. So it's an unusual join, which is why it has to be done in GeoPandas and not SQL, but it's, it's, it's nice. It's a nice example. So that's why we chose to do it. So there's some text describing, saying what I'm saying basically there. So this is the GeoPandas command that we've imported called sjoin. To give a sense of what's going to go on, first of all, I'm going to show you the columns from the hospital data. So this is the data which is giving us the information about the hospitals, the facility name, all these other things. Now remember, Eric created this new column from GeoPandas that's called geometry. Okay, so those are the different columns from the hospitals. And now here's the different columns from the zones. Okay, we also have a geometry here. So these two geometries are different. One of the geometries is the outline of the state and the other geometry is a point, the location of the state. But if I look at the intersection, so if you know about sets, this is a nice, this is a quite a useful thing to do in Python in general. What I'm doing is I'm creating a set. So a set is a unique list uh, from this set of columns and another set from this set of columns. And I'm asking for the intersection between them. The intersection between them is the geometry. So when we do the joining between the two, it's going to join on the geometry. And this is the join command we imported earlier. So that's what this line is doing. So now we join those two data sets together. And what we have now, so before, look at this, okay? So we had geometry, geometry. This is all the sort of region codes, the names of the regions, alternative names, postcodes, um, the, the data validation. Look how nice the data is. It tells us what the validity of this is because districts, or as, as Martin well knows from lots of work in Uganda can change over time. Districts can split. So it's got all that sort of information. We've done the join here. Now, what do we expect? Well, it's, it, this is called a left or outer join. So what we expect is a new database which contains all the information in the old database apart from, okay? So what we have now, so I'm doing the set of the, um, this is the set of the two databases that I'm trying to join the HOSP GDF columns and the zones GDF columns, right? Look at all these columns. That's not just the information about the hospitals, but now the administration areas too. And then if we look at the new set of the join columns, so, so here I've just joined the two different things as two sets. And then I'm looking at the columns of the join system, right? So there's two different things going on here. One, I'm trying to look at the, to the union of the columns from the hospital data and the zones data. That's that list. But the next thing I'm going to do is just look at the columns from the joined data. So we've done the join up here, right? Okay, here's the columns from the join data. And look, they're the same, yeah? They're almost exactly the same, only there's one new column in here that's called index right that introduces the state name. Okay, so that's what the join does. It takes those two databases. We're joining on the geometry in this case, and this is an outer join. And in an outer join, you, you, you um, combine all, well, you combine all those columns in an inner join too, but in the outer join, you do that for every single point um, that's in both data sets. There's links to describe the different types of joins as well. So now we have this join data. So we've got the facility name, but if we go all the way across to the right, look at the, we've got this additional information about the admin postal code, NG009, 
the ad, admin reference name. So this is a much cleaner reference name now. So we've got these state names. Um, so that's in Cross River, I think, is uh, where we are, which is, you know, this information just isn't in these, um, the, uh, info, the original data. Cool. Let me, let me stop there for a moment to see if there are any questions about the join. Oh, is it based on a common? Yeah, so it's geometry. Thanks, Oz, but that's a great question. Yeah, normally it would be based on a common ID, but because this is a geographic join, it's a little bit unusual. But we want it, but we kind of needed this information. And I mean, perhaps it's not the best join to do first, to be honest, but it's such a useful thing for some of the applications. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. What I spent ages saying, Eric's just beautifully summarized in two sentences. The join here is based on the geometry column. In particular, health facilities have a point geometry and the admin zones have a polygon geometry and it joins if the point is inside the polygon. Yeah, so that's what this map is trying to show. More questions or comments from Eric and Andre, things that you think weren't clear or we missed. How long did it take you to work all that out, Eric? That's an important question. Uh, to do the join stuff? I hadn't done it, so maybe a, probably a, a day to figure out the join, the spatial join things. Eric and I hadn't worked on geospatial data before, so he had to work out on this, uh, how to do it in Python from scratch. John, is this the sort of thing you do a lot? Did we do it right, John? When we, I, I just want to check in with John Quinn because he sort of does this stuff properly. But you know, he's probably, he's gone now because he's so upset with me about what I said about his Python coding. Cool, okay. I think he is actually gone. He is gone, yeah. I have to say, and actually, uh, Charles used to be quite upset with me because Sheffield United continuously beating Arsenal, but um, but we kindly lost to them in the uh, FA Cup quarterfinals so that they could have some commiseration trophy for their season. But, but I, Charles, what level is Sheffield United in the table? Just if you put that in the chat, Charles, what's um, Sheffield United's position in the table versus Arsenal's? Just to check. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to say anything about that. <laughs> Well, it's just, it's, it's so unfortunate that um, we allowed Sheffield to, to get ahead, ahead of us this time. But hopefully, it's next nice. season is going to You're just generous hosts. That's, that's you know, your, your, your hosting of us in the Premiership has been as generous as your hosting of us in Abuja was, Charles, most kind. <laughs> Any it's, other it's, questions it's, about Sheffield United and how did they beat uh, <laughs> Arsenal twice? Any other questions on that? Um, before we move on, because uh, it's important. <laughs> okay, right. Well, uh, all questions on joins as well. We can quite we can do questions on joins too. Uh, we were actually in Ethiopia with Charles when uh, not Ethiopia in uh, Accra, Accra in Ghana with Charles. Uh, for the first of those matches. Okay. Um, yeah, go ahead, Charles. So uh, I, in the joint, I saw there's a left, the, the, the parameter how. Could yeah. you please explain um, the other parameters, I, I believe, the left, yeah. right, the full join and all that. Now, I'm not expert on this, but I'm going to say something and then we'll see if Andre and Eric agree with me. Or maybe I should just let Eric say it. You say it, Eric, and then I'll see if I agree with you. Oh, no, I have to be worried if I'm, I'm correct on it. Um, well, I think in a join, so a left join is also known as an outer join. Is that correct? Um, and an sure. inner join, you only retain rows where you have a match. Correct. And in an outer join, you retain all rows. Now, in this case, we've got a full match, so it doesn't matter whether we did in or outer, or we should have. But I think in a in general, what you can end up with with an outer join is you can end up with dislocated rows. So you can end up with these sort of where, for example, we have Charles's home address in one database, but we don't have his work address in the other database. So what would happen then is in the databases, Charles would appear as a role, 
but you would get a load of nulls where his work address should be. So a null is, is in pandas, that would be an np.nan and not a number. But in, in SQL, it's called a null. And that would indicate the data is missing. Um, and vice versa, if we had my work address, but we didn't have my home address, then we would, we would see nulls on the other side. Um, that's roughly it, isn't it, Eric? Yeah, the... that's, I, I think so. There's a third that is some combination of those two. It's easy yeah, to describe it in a Venn diagram. Like, yeah. There's like ones where you drop the right hand side and ones where you drop the left. Yeah, things yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, any other questions on that? That was a good question. Thanks, Charles. I'm going to just, uh, how are we doing for 85 participants? It's gone up. Right. So, so we're doing okay. If it had dropped down to 40, I'd have been worried. It's the only way you can tell whether people are, <laughs> well, John's disappeared anyway, so that doesn't count. Um, <laughs> okay. So, um, there's the header on the new join thing. Fantastic. We fantastic. We've got something in pandas, but we're not only SQL. We're not only SQL. We're going on about SQL. I said that pandas is like piece of string, sticky tape, putting everything on a single bottom bottle. Not a good idea. What we really want to do is um, understand what this looks like uh, for a database. Now, um, just for simplicity, uh, in the real world, what you would do is you would have a database server. So if we go back like 20 years uh, to the time when people were building internet startups, what they had to do is they, they had some idea and they needed to build a database server. So they would, they would buy some computers to, um, to serve their website, to do this servicing uh, through these APIs, although it wasn't called REST API then. Um, and they would own that computer and it would sit in a room or something typically. Now, that what would happen problematically, they would install a SQL server on it. So they would install a, a server, a database server on that machine. But then what would tend to happen is if their app was, so one of two things would happen. Either no one would care about their app and they would have this computer just sitting there idle or their app would be very successful. Everyone in Lagos would download it. And then the computer they'd bought was not big enough for them to service all the queries because serving these queries on databases, doing the set of operations we're talking about costs compute. So this is why cloud computing is so big because what you would do nowadays is not buy a computer. You would rent space on a computer from AWS or Google or Microsoft Azure, and you would put the server in the cloud. So what does the cloud mean? It just means, a big data center that Google own or Amazon own. And I believe there's some open now in, there's some opening in Africa, which is really good because you sort of want the data center to be within as, as close to you as possible um, for, for a couple of reasons, but particularly legal reasons. So you have these zones around the world. So there's a zone for North America, there's a zone for Europe where you can rent a server and then you can just install whatever you like on that server. And the sort of thing you might have installed very commonly is MySQL, which is a database server. That's free or a very robust and efficient uh, SQL server that lots of people use is Microsoft SQL Server, but that costs you money to buy the license if this is free. So in both you'd have to pay for compute, which is probably gonna be a dominant cost if you're successful. So you have to rent the compute. And for these services, you, you spend money on your storage and your compute. Um, any comments on that, Andre or Eric? Am I getting any of that wrong? So just to sort of give you a patch in, this is very much how a startup like 12 years ago would likely have done stuff. Use AWS to create and connect to a MySQL database. So there's a management console for that, create a MySQL DB instance. So this is a database server that would be on the internet. So you can all set this up. The one of the beautiful things now, you don't have to buy the machines, you can just set this up. And you can even set it up on a free tier, right? To just test things. Um, it's pretty nice. So look, they've got some different database options. One of them is Microsoft SQL Server. There's Oracle, PostgreSQL, there's different SQL servers, right? 
that you can set up. But we didn't do that today. We didn't do that because we didn't need to, to show what, what, what we wanted to show you. What we are using, and you can also play with this a lot, this is really easy to play with, is a database system. So these are all just different versions of SQL. Uh, I never know how to say this one, SQLite, SQLite, I don't know. But the nice thing about this is instead of having to set it up on the web, you just have it on your computer locally. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna write this new database we created, Eric created to a CSV file. And then we're gonna install this little utility called CSV to SQLite. And then we're gonna, okay. So mine says error because the table already exists because I forgot to delete things and restart. But yours will just create that. So you'll then create a new database. And in SQLite, it's very simple. The database is just a file on your machine locally. So there's no internet connections going on like there would be normally. There's no reaching out to other things. And that just makes it easy for us to sort of show you some simple stuff in SQL. So that's what this says here. And now that's done, you can access using SQL. Now, um, when you're using something like SQL in Python, what you typically do is write wrappers. So this is a little definition Eric's written that creates a connection to the database. So th the way you interact with the database is you, you create a connection and then you make a request from the database. So Eric's written a little bit of code, a little bit of help here, helper code here. Well, we first we import, so SQLite 3 is the Python library for dealing with SQLite. Then we create a connection. Sorry, then we um, bring the uh, file, Eric's, the, the function Eric's written into memory, and then we create a connection. Now, this SQL itself, this is the sort of thing it looks like. So this command, it's called a select command. And this star means every record. And then the nature of the command is you say, select every record, this is what this is saying, from a given table, table, right? But then actually we said every record, but now we're gonna have a limit on the number of records we're gonna return, which is n. So this is the form of SQL. They're pretty ugly, these commands. They get really, really long. And they're in capital letters because they're old. In the old days, people used to program in capital letters for some reason. Um, and I can say that because that was true even when I was young. Oh, it's a Q&A question. Ah, Sheena's saying, if you do left on a geographical data and you have a missing data, how do you handle such without removing that particular data entry? Very um, good question. Um, the second question on here, Eric, is uh, how to get access to the notebook. So could you just pop up the link again in the chat? Yeah, I'm getting it. Um, that's from Bernard. But Sheena, your question's excellent. And the answer is it depends. It depends on what you're trying to do with the data and why the data is missing. In this case, it would probably indicate a problem because it, sh it, would, pro it would indicate that we had a, a health center in our health center database that didn't fall in any of the Nigerian states. And since we've got a health center database of um, Nigerian health centers, that would be surprising. And that sort of surprise is the sort of thing you should follow up because it indicates an error. It indicates something's wrong with your assumptions or something's wrong with the data. And you must, 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 must find out what's wrong. So if you know the reason why the data should be missing, that's okay. And you may have some route to dealing with it. Um, if you don't know the route uh, to the data, if you don't know why the, um, data is missing you really have to investigate because it indicates a problem and a problem that will come back and bite you later and the moment you discover the problem you must follow it up um, hopefully you'll find out why that's missing and that might involve doing some different data entry or changing your data acquisition pipeline or something else uh, anonymous attendee is asking can we have access to the data sets yes they're all there in the notebook when you run the notebook it will download them for you yeah so they're all public, they're all public, anonymous attendee. Um, so you can get them all. Uh, 
Dina and the um, Nelson Mandela African Institute of Science and Technology team are asking what other databases would you use in place of SQL? That's actually starting to hit the limits of my knowledge. This, for speed reasons, is this right, Eric and Andre? You, this, there's something called NoSQL, right? Which is not a relational database. So but I'll so leave that, that to Andre. Andre. Yeah, so there might be multiple, like in a sense, well, well, what this question is about is where data could be. And uh, it could be an SQL database. It could be in, um, in just a bunch of files. And you just go through a bunch of files and you extract data from there. It could be in uh, something called NoSQL database, which is a, um, um, it's a fairly, like it's a, compared to SQL, it's a relatively new concept, but it's essentially a, uh, bunch of uh, maybe documents formatted in certain way that have certain relationship between them. So um, the, the, the point is there are various ways to store the data, each of them designed for their own purpose. And the, the reason we're showing a scale here is that it's probably um, probably the most common and the most like, and the most illustrative one, but it's uh, certainly not the only one. And I, I'll probably type in uh, in the Q&A a little bit more, you know, uh, that would be great Andrew. sense for you to, to look into after the session. Yeah, or just put them in the chat now. That would be great. Um, I, I just want to add to that that um, we'll talk about this a bit later, but another way you can store this is in a streaming system, right? So this yeah. is, occurs at the same layer um, where if you view the data as changing over time, um, there's particular kinds of databases called streams yeah. that handle this. Yeah, and I'm going to have to accelerate a little bit so that we get to that, aren't I? Um, because, yeah, streaming is the modern way of, or the way that things are going. So SQL has been around a long time, but things, as you can see from the capital letters. So Eric's written what we call a SQL wrapper here, right? So he's written a bit of Python commands. And what you can see in here, this is where the SQL commands. And this is a classic thing that you do for doing SQL. You, you do have to write SQL yourself. And sometimes you have to write a lot of SQL. There's certainly in Amazon, there were places where people wrote a lot of SQL. But if you're writing a system, this is the sort of thing you might do. You write a little a bit of code in Java or Python or, or Scala or whatever. And this gets the table for you. So Eric's written something to fetch a table called uh, um, select top. So select top is he's selecting the first N entries. The limit number is N. That's all being fed in down here from a given table. Um, Can and I just briefly so interject that Andre actually wrote all the SQL code. I don't want to. Oh, sorry, Andre. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, although I wrote this, this bit of code here. So, uh, um, so Andre did the SQL. Yeah, Eric did the pandas. Andre did the SQL. Um, so I've written, so I've, I've said, well, oh, the select top. So if I'd select the, the top five head, which was what we were using with pandas, I can now write my own version of head, right? Which is going to work on the, the SQL table. So I've got this connection open. So earlier here, I've opened the connection to the database. That's important. Once the connection's open, it's in this sort of little handle here called con. And then what you can see I, I've written here is take a connection, take a table name and return the top five. So instead of doing the pandas.head, what this little function is doing here is take, opening that connection and returning the top five facilities. So that you, if you look, this is exactly the same as what you'll see above when you do uh, hosp data dot, um, uh, dot head. Only it's not as nicely formatted because I didn't, we didn't do the formatting in this bit. Okay, so now we've got this in SQL. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Now what we're going to do now is, now, the wonderful Elaine and Suizi, who I think is going to be talking at some point, but she's super busy at the moment because she's public health, uh, who does a lot of work for DSA. One of the things she has done recently is build a GitHub repo, which has the uh, list of, of African cases of COVID. Uh, so this is up to 20th of May. So this isn't the, so these Nigerian cases don't go beyond 20th of May. So it's not current, but uh, wonderful Elaine, our wonderful Elaine, who's at Boston University for those who don't know her. Um, but um, 
a great supporter of DSA, uh, has created this uh, GitHub repo, and we're going to now download from that in the same way as before into a CSV, and we're going to get it into Pandas, the cases of COVID up to the 20th of May. And we'll look, as we always do, at what the head of that file is, right? So you can see what the cases look like. They're giving us an age, a gender, country, a source where we found out about the case is very often Twitter, where the date of the admission to hospital. So, so a lot of work has been done trying to pull these cases together. And yes, once again, we can look at the columns. And what we're going to do now is we're going to add this as another table in CSV Lite. So it's, it's mine will throw an error again, yours won't. So if you do this, you sh it will just add it. Um, I get an error because my table already exists. But basically, we've added now this CSV as another table in the database. Oh, Medanyi's raised hand. Do you have a question, Medanyi? Ah, multiple read-write queries to the same table at the same time with SQLite 3. Jared, great question, Jared. Um, my answer is I doubt it because that's the sort of, sort of thing that you have to do a lot of work to handle when you write a database survey. Maybe you can. Um, but I think the whole point in SQLite is it's just for a single user. I'm not sure on that. You might be able to, but I, it's not, this is why you shouldn't really be using it as a main uh, database server because... So I, uh, yeah, a quick note here. I believe you can do a couple of, like you can share the same file for reads but I you know, but, but, but I also write. think that you you have to lock it exclusively for write. Yeah. So yeah, for read, it's not a problem, is it? Because it's um, uh, you're not editing it, but because it's just a, a file. I think that's all. As I think Andre was just implying, that's dependent on the operating system, and the operating system typically won't allow two writes to the same file at the same time. Um, which is why you know, real databases are complex because you do allow that type of thing to happen. Um, Eric's looking a little bit like he has something to say on that. So I may have got something wrong there. Yeah, I, I just wanted to clarify. So, so that would typically be handled by the database itself. So when you, when you make a connection and then you send a query, the database will do some sort of queuing or scheduling of these queries that come in. And uh, typically they would um, do this atomically, right? So I, I would expect SQLite to allow you to, to do this at the same time, now with databases, obviously you can't write to the same file like Neil was saying at the same time, but usually they'll just handle this for you. SQLite probably just can't handle a lot of connections. They tend to be quite slow um, if you have like a hundred machines trying to read and write at the same time. Um, that would be the main thing for But SQL. it's a great thing to, I mean, and a couple of points on that. So here's the sort of thing, if you're building a machine learning system, you should be doing, right? This is another reason why you write these helper functions, because most SQL is the same, but there's some variants, like Microsoft SQL has particular extensions. And then what you find is you're calling this, right? If you decide to change SQL Server, so you're moving some SQLite to MySQL or to um, Microsoft SQL Server, then the only place where you'll have to change things is potentially in here. And for the most basic commands, you won't have to change anything because SQL is the same query language. Um, I can't remember what it stands for. Is it server query language or something like that? So, so you know, there's some portability there, but you really want to make sure that you're using this type of structure so that if you do something that's non-portable, you can edit it directly. You can even have checks um, of what, I mean, really you should be doing that object oriented and all sorts of stuff. But. Okay, so while we were sort of saying that, I've also loaded in the population data. So another data set, again, from the Humanitarian Data Exchange, this is just the population of the different states of Nigeria. So you can see federal capital table, et cetera. Um, and we're just gonna, as we have done before, we're gonna save that to the database file. So we have now a SQLite database that has three different tables in it. It's got the hospital table, which contains the hospitals, which state they're in, and how many doctors are in each hospital, nurses and community health, can't remember what the E stands for, exchange, workers, et cetera, et cetera. We've got the number of COVID cases and we've got the population. 
So now you've got all those things, you can start doing things like counting how many COVID cases there are. So we've got two ways of doing that here. And I'm going to just speed up to make sure we get to the streaming bit. But the thing I'm a little bit speeding through here is this other command group by, which is also important for databases. So what group by is doing is it's allowing us in this case, we're interested in the total number of COVID cases. Remember that database table that we got that Elaine had created or Elaine was facilitated the creation of on GitHub. It has individual cases. What this command is doing now, what a group by command says, take that data and group it by the province and count those in the province. That gives us an updated data frame, which in database parlance would be a table, which is telling us how many COVID cases we have in each state. Yeah. So this group by, another important command is allowing you to go from this type of data structure where you've got the individual cases, this was the original thing, and convert that into a single table grouped by the state and counted. And once again, you can do the same thing. So these commands are just putting that back into the database. Right, so we've now got an updated database. Um, I'm going to just skip through that because I also then want to show that then it's there in SQL and then hand over to Eric. So once we've got that grouping, what we're doing here is um, combining different columns of the database. So this, Eric, this is host per capita 10K. So this is number of um, hospitals per 10,000 people. Is that right? Yeah. So what Eric's done here is after doing that group by, he's then counting the number of hospitals in this second group by argument here, which you can sort of have a look at um, a little bit in your own time. And then he's creating this new field, which is the number of hospitals in a state um, divided by the population, but all times 10,000. So it's the number of hospitals per 10,000 people. Now that then gives us the ability to start doing some fun maps because we put all this into a database. Well, we're doing it in SQL as well, sorry. So this is the equivalent command in SQL. So we're selecting uh, from the provinces, province column, we're selecting um, all the case counts and grouping by, this is the, um, uh, the SQL for pulling together the, um, uh, the total number of COVID cases. And then this is the um, same for facilities. So this SQL command here is doing the same thing in SQL. So you can see it looks quite different. And, and all this stuff in the, in the, and this is a very common way of doing it to sort of use this Python style of three inverted commas to start and end the SQL. Um, and you get the same result in SQL that we had in Pandas. So this here we're printing. So this is a sort of printout from that database. Um, of each state, how many COVID cases, how many health facilities, yeah? You can see why this sort of information is, uh, is useful. Great. Okay, so then the final thing on here is just to show some plots and a little exercise for you to try and do. So, so one of the things you can try and do with that is add a new column for the number of COVID cases per 10,000 people. I'd say another thing you could do is this is all per health facility, but some of these health facilities are hospitals with hundreds of doctors, and some of these health facilities are just one nurse in a village. So you could look at COVID cases per doctor or COVID cases per nurse. Um, and you can do all these exercises with the data you've got in here. And once you've got that, then you can start doing things like mapping it. So this is a little plot of the population of Nigerian states. 
I'm confused about this because why is that so high and we don't see high down in Lagos? I'm a bit confused, unless I'm really confused about Nigerian geography. Um, this is the cases per, oh, oh, we don't have that one at the moment because you've got to fill in some stuff to do that one. Yes, yeah, so these some of these others, you've got to fill in some stuff. So let me pause there briefly and check with Billy how we're doing on time and questions and stuff, because I think you said about two hours and we're starting to run up against that. Um, Billy. Hey, I'm just a uh, question from Haven. Is Billy there? You're muted if you're speaking, Billy. Okay, we'll plow on, we'll plow on. Okay, so um, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna switch over to Eric, right? Because what I've showed you is SQL, but when we go to modern machine learning systems design, as Eric was saying earlier, streaming ecosystems for data are all the rage. So in everything I've showed you, we had to, we had existing databases, which someone else has potentially built, and we make a call to those databases to get the data. So you might think, well, what happens if someone updates those databases? Well, we don't know until we query the database again. That's the situation with this. So if you wanna know about an update, you have to ask the database again, and then you see an update. Modern data, architectures do something very different. They are called streaming and what they do is they tell you when they're updated and they push you information. So it's like a, it's like a hose that the data comes towards you. So they're push rather than pull. This is a pull structure. And Eric's just gonna go through um, a little bit of what that looks like very briefly. Um, we couldn't get it into the notebook in time. But over to you, Eric. Great, thanks. Yep, so if we come here yeah we can see code and such so uh yeah and you might want to send your screens to full screen if you're having trouble seeing the text on eric's code so just enter full screen on the top right that might have done it already for some of you uh okay i don't need to do anything great you don't need to do anything people, okay. might, people at home people watching at home may need to okay um so i think the the first thing um, to talk about here is that, uh, like Neil mentioned previously, um, this is not very, uh, the, um, so what I'm doing here is running a Kafka server, which is a streaming infrastructure. So it allows you to set up essentially independent databases um, that can receive uh, data in an ongoing way. So they listen um, to the world and that's running just through Docker um, on my machine. So it's kind of a one click thing. And so once we have that, um, I'm using a library called Faust in Python, which lets us access uh, that, those Kafka streams, so it, cre it creates Topics, so you can think of topics and tables as uh, somewhat equivalent concepts to the database tables that we made in the notebook there. Uh, so we have, uh, much like we had a table for facilities and for COVID cases and for state populations. Um, here we have another one for um, cases per capita and this is our target in this. So this is slightly simplified from what we were doing previously. Um, I'm just going to try and compute uh, in a sort of live fashion um, what the cases per capita in each state are. Um, if we sort of simulate that uh, the, the case data is coming in. So I'm not going to go over all this code. Um, it will all be available on the GitHub. Um, so you can find it there. But Maybe I'll take a second for questions. I see chat doing things. I can figure out how to get to it. It's only me just giving them links to Kafka and stuff. In the uh, okay, great. Um, I'll pause for a, a moment. So 
what um, I'm going to do here is, so I've written a small script for Um, for sort of simulating incoming data, right? Um, so normally you would expect population data to be quite static. In this case, I'm just um, assuming that maybe it gets updated. Maybe this is on a monthly basis. Doesn't really matter for this case. Um, so this file just is just reading in the exact same population data that we had before and then writing it into a Kafka stream here, right? So if we run this file, populations to stream. Um, uh, it runs a bit slowly, which is helpful for, for us now. Um, this would run differently in a production system. But you can see it's, um, so these are the outputs of what it's sending to Kafka, um, the underlying stream. And you can see over here in the right window, this is uh, a worker that is listening for incoming data. And when it receives this incoming data, right, so it's updating the population for the state of Kano um, with here's what the data is, and these, these go on. Um, so it's going so at it. You can think of like these stream, I mean, imagine in some sense, all data is always streaming, and somehow the database is a snapshot of it. Uh, is, is one way of thinking about it. So you can sort of look at that snapshot at any time, but you're not really aware when things have changed. But look what Eric's showing here in these streaming systems, instead of getting a snapshot of the database, you're constantly getting what the changes to the database are. You're getting pushed when things have changed. So it's a sort of reverse way of thinking about the data store. Sorry, carry on, Eric. Yeah, no, that was great. Thank you, Neil. Um, so uh, here we've now written all of the populations to the database. Um, and you can imagine this changing over time, but not often. And now we're going to start writing cases. So I have this, essentially the same file, um, I'll show it real briefly, for cases. So it downloads the COVID data. Um, it turns each of them into a JSON in this, in this case. That's what um, this Faust library likes to take in. And then we just run, we send it, right? So in this file, we download, we process them into a JSON in this section, and then we send um, each record, each row in the COVID. So this is each case. We send it um, to the Kafka stream here. Yeah. So, so JSON, we... um, if, if you're not, uh, haven't seen it um, before, JSON is just a text way of writing objects. So uh, lots of different, it was actually developed initially, I think JavaScript does store its objects natively. That's a particular language used on the web in JSON format. And it just became a de facto way of pushing objects around in a text style. Uh, very widely used now. Another one would be YAML, but JSON I think is more used for these sort of REST APIs and things like that, a way of sort of taking an object, converting it into a, a text and pushing it somewhere. It was this time when it was all going to be XML, and thank God that time's over. Now it's mostly JSON. Sorry, back to you, Eric. No, that was great. Yeah, so, so as an example of that, these are JSON objects, right? So it, they're just key value pairs of, of objects, um, nothing fancy going on there. And uh, to throw back a little bit, so NoSQL databases typically store everything in JSON format. That's what like DynamoDB or um, many of these databases look like, and that's what one of the primary ways that they're different from SQL databases, which are stored in this sort of column row structure. Um, anyways, so now we can write these cases. Um, so you'll see when I, when I run this, um, so on the right, we were updating the cases per capita um, in addition to the state population, right? So what that's doing is essentially, um, doing a join on these tables, right? So it says when I get a new case that comes in, so you can see cases for Lagos, um, it is updating this independent stream, which is the cases per capita. So we're only writing to the cases stream here, um, and uh, we have code elsewhere. I suppose I can show that. As Eric gets that up, you see that you see this sort of difference here. So 
I mean, really, genuinely, those Lagos cases have come in in a streaming way, right? So it's like, oh, we saw this on Twitter, we saw that, we know the date when it happened. So that's how data happens in the real world. It, you know, something happens at some time in some place. And really, the streaming ecosystem is reflecting that a lot more than the database system. And what Eric's pointing out now is that instead of the, the sort of joins and things you do on streaming ecosystems are slightly different because you set them up to happen when the database is updated. So every time a new case is coming in, Eric's just pulled up the system which is then saying every time that stream is updated update this other stream which is the total number of cases which is probably what we care about is that roughly right eric yeah yeah that's that's right um so in um so in this in this faust language um they don't natively sort of as an operator support joins but but this is rough essentially what i'm doing here Right, just like Neil said, so we get a case. Um, notice that we're doing this group by. Um, this isn't super important when you get them one by one, but if this were in batches, it would be more important. Um, and we update uh, the cases in this state. So this is just um, a, a sort of local table. This could be stored in a cache system or a local database, even uh, a local NoSQL database like RocksDB type thing. Um, and we, we print that out. That's where you're seeing this. And then um, if there's no state there, we, we give it a state. Um, that's fine. But otherwise, we update the cases per capita here. That's what CPC stands for. Um, and this, sorry, do you have something, Neil? Oh, only, um, you know, carry on, keep going. OK. Um, and this cases per capita, right? So these. Um, what look like just local Python dictionaries, right? These are actually um, tables that are stored in Kafka. And so in a production system, these tables um, would be partitioned, say there were you know, a million or a billion rows in this table, these would be partitioned across many machines. Um, and that's why uh, we use this sort of table and topic infrastructure because underneath uh, this is what Kafka handles for us and allows us. Um, so I, I could easily write this example for, you know, two streams coming together. I could just do this in raw Python. There's no reason for me to do this. But if there's a million cases coming in, I'm going to need to do this across multiple machines in order to do it at scale um, with any speed. And so that's why we use uh, these sort of distributed tables and this topic, which is like a, which is a stream here um, that allow so us can... to scale up and Ahead, I mean, you can see from the Python, so uh, Osbert uh, made a, a useful comment uh, to us in the back chat that um, the JSONs are storing effectively what you had in your Python dictionaries this morning. So, so when you had these, so that you can see, look how close it looks to the Python dictionary, actually, the format, doesn't it? It looks almost exactly like it, very similar. So you've got each new incoming case we've got an identity we've got an age which is missing a gender that's missing a city that's missing and a state right so or we're missing some data here as, as you often are but we're seeing where these cases are recurring as they're coming in and this is replaying the covid epidemic sort of as live obviously um in practice they they came in at different um uh a different time it's much slower than this um but um the what Kafka's allowing us to do is effectively see that data as an evolving dictionary, right? And that we are then that, that Eric has built these commands on that every time it, the dictionary evolves, each of them go, oh, okay, create this other dictionary, create this other structure there. So that means your code, instead of constantly sort of going out and saying, please give me what you've got your code switches to this thing that these dictionaries are sort of evolving, but it tells you when, when they've evolved. And then every time that happens, you run something, which is totally different to the way we're talking about things with SQL. Sorry, Eric, that was just triggered by something in the background from um, uh, Osbert. No, that's great, yeah. Um, I'll probably just open it up to questions. I'm not sure. 
Yeah, what Andre else? has to head off. So if Correctly. Andre, um, because well, he doesn't have to head off, but his laptop's running out of battery. So, uh, <laughs> okay. I don't know if Andre, if you had anything you wanted to add, probably now's a good time. Um, but also, if there are yeah. questions yeah. about yeah. what we so, said, yeah. Like a quick note here would be that uh, going back to the APIs node that we had in the chat earlier, uh, now as we see in the streaming, the streaming is um, another way of separating out these different, you know, maybe different machine learning solutions, or maybe different parts of your application. Because now you can see that instead of calling each other through services, what you do is one one part of your application produces a stream, another part of this of your application consumes a stream, and uh, there's really no uh, reason for these applications to know about like how each other is implemented. So one could be in Python and doing machine learning, and another could be in Java and just collecting data. Yeah. So. Um... On that front, we could all come back to what we were sort of showing at the beginning, which is this old diagram here. So now you can imagine. So we've shown two things. One where the supply forecast is asking the demand forecast for an update by a SQL. So it has to download, like we had to download the CSVs, and then it does a join or whatever. But what we're showing now is a different situation where the demand forecast is pushing a stream out to the supply forecast. And this is the modern way in which these systems are built. So the, there's a background behind all this that handles all the streams, and that's what we call Kafka or RabbitMQ or whatever streaming system we're using. But the, the messages are now pushed down these pipelines instead of pulled by supply. So the demand pushes into supply, supply pushes into cost, cost pushes into purchase order, rather than pulling around the other way around. Um, just to sort of close the loop there on that so questions questions we're we're at or over time we're over time billy hasn't been shouting at me or us no i can go on forever you know to be honest but questions we're 91 we're almost an all-time high participants because people thought it was someone else speaking now not us Okay, so Charles is saying, I still don't understand Kafka how it relates to the database. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we could have done more on that time-wise, Charles. So let me sort of try and pull back. In some sense, um, think about real world data, right? You know, um, you, know you, you get up in the morning, you look at the TV, you see Arsenal have lost again. That's... Um, you know, a, a sort of piece of information that you absorb. Of course, you could also check in a database all of our store results, but the more natural way things happen is actually information comes towards you. So it's a sort of different way of thinking about data. The database is like, it's like the premiership table. It's stored. You can go and look it up. I mean, that's a summary of what's going on in the overall football. But the streaming system is like an ecosystem where you're getting the results coming in, like that ticker at the bottom, right? So when you watch uh, the ticker in the football, that's like a streaming system. Um, so they're very different ways of thinking about the data, but you can do almost precisely the same thing with them. But everything in the modern era is moving towards the streaming thing. Whereas machine learning is a little bit stuck in this world of tables and things like that, batch learning. So as you go towards streaming, you start talking about onlining and things like that. I'm getting the signal from Billy that we can start wrapping up though. So that's a nice question. Um, allowed me to get in another dig at Arsenal, which is always important. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, that was really great to have the chance to speak. Sorry for sort of slightly overrunning. Was there any final thing you wanted to say, Eric? No, I don't think so. That seems... As we say, the, the notebooks are online and we'll get the streaming stuff up in some form as well. Uh, the yeah. reason it's sort of a bit later is because we, um, obviously we were doing the notebook first and then so the streaming we pulled together yesterday. Uh, so it needs a bit, or Eric pulled it together yesterday. Brilliant. Thanks, Billy. Do you want to step in and throw us off? Sure. Thanks a lot, guys.
This was fantastic. I hope everyone learned some valuable tips and tricks for the, I'm, I'm hoping that next time we meet, hopefully in person, we are able to see some systems taking advantage of this ideas here. Yeah, I'd say, um, I guess the reason we like started focusing lectures. on this, yeah, sorry, Billy, just to say in that sense, the reason we decided to start focusing on this, because I think it's the missing, it's the missing piece in a lot of DSA applications, isn't it? When people are trying to pull things together, they deploy sensors in the real world, they write ML models, but it's all this infrastructure that they need in between. Yeah. Um, the material, like all the previous materials, will be available online shortly. Uh, we are doing the best we can to quickly compile them up. Um, in the meantime, Dorothy, can you prepare to amaze us with the visualization slides? Okay, thank you, Billy, for that. Mm -hmm. So let me share my screen. Uh, can we all see? I see. Yes, we can see it now. Uh, someone raised their hand. I think they have a question before I move on. Okay, so uh, hello everyone. My name is Dorothy Kavarozi Bujingo, and I'll be taking you through one of the core skills of data science. Okay, not really core, but like every data scientist needs to know how to visualize their data. So this is one of the skills that everyone needs to know if they are into this field. So I'll be taking you through the theory part and my friends Claire and Hewitt Sime will be doing the practical session. So feel free to share your questions. Yeah, in the, in the Q and A part. So uh, what is the data visualization? Uh, really in short, it's it's just the communication of data in a visual manner. Uh, you have your raw data and you want to show, you want to learn it and then understand it, then visualize it for future insights and maybe predictions, yeah, to your audience. So every story behind you, you have, there's a story behind your numbers and visualizing data helps them come to life. Basically, that's it. So, why do we even visualize data? Uh, we can have so many data sets, uh, complex data sets, and you may not really make sense of, out of them, but when you have a picture showing um, your data and what it is trying to, the functionality behind it, so it's easier to understand with a picture than so many words. So um, uh, vis data visualization, visualization um, it's when data, when you have the data, it meets the design and then the functionality of the data. So what is, what is the purpose of the data? What are you trying to find? Then also you can't visualize without the data. So these three parts all make a good visualization. So another thing is um, it is easier to remember pictures than the text. And also you can summarize large and complex amounts of data with a visualization, yeah. So the purpose is really storytelling. Yes, you have this data set, but then what are you trying to show? What are you trying to analyze? So with visualization, it's able to show you, to make you understand your data and analyze it. Then also storytelling, communicate the findings, and also draw attention to key messages of what you're trying to portray. Um, so how do we use visualization to communicate effectively? So the main part is understanding your data. Um, 
really focus on the data and try to understand it, then also understand what it's trying to do, what's its purpose. I think I highlighted this. And also understand the people you're going to present to the audience, or maybe who are you trying to explain all this visual uh, pattern you've come up with. So it also it's also good to it helps to tell a good story and also do not visualize what does not matter. Like focus on what you are you intending to the purpose, what you're intending to show. Don't show the irrelevant part. Yeah. So I'll, then um, another other aspects of visualization. Um, the main aspects mainly are color, size, and maybe shape. Yeah. So uh, this visual this this diagram shows uh, life expectancy in the world of into in 2009 was 69 years around here. So if, if it wasn't like color to emphasize that you wouldn't really, you wouldn't really know what they're trying to say. Yeah. Then am I very fast? You can just uh, show by hand or something. Yeah. So uh, I'll go next um, on the next slide. So these are other ways of emphasizing what you're trying to put across. You can see um, this shape here, it really stands out on the eyes of, of the audience. Let's say people are looking at your visual uh, diagram and shapes alone can change the way you're trying to portray your message. Uh, also sizes, if let's say you're trying to put the bubbles and what, so if you showed a bigger size of a bubble emphasizing something, it would be better for it would be better for you to actually put your put your points across or what you're trying to portray. Um, also, color. This is really one of the main ones. Uh, if just you can vividly see that the red really stands out from all this without having to explain much, just with a picture. Yeah. So another thing is knowing how to portray to portray your data say if you have data that is continuous you, have, you can use a line and column graph you have data maybe trying to portray comparisons you can do the part the bar charts and uh, the columns and the line charts then if you have if you want to show trends like continuous data like time and money uh you can use the line graphs then um if you if you have if you want to show correlations and relationships uh, between variables, yeah, you can use the scatter plots and all. So here, um, I'll, I'll sh I'll sh it's, it's a, a picture I got uh, that that shows COVID. Uh, the people were tested. The people who are who are tested and they are in March in March around twentieth. So in the whole world, so it's showing in Philippines around March, there was per every 100, 1,000 tests, there were like 500 plus people who were sick. So it was higher in March for them than the rest of the countries. Yeah. And also this is, I'm trying to do comparisons and information over time compared to, and also this you can't really you can show it in a, in a pie chart but it can't really be as descriptive as it is here with a pie chart yeah so also think about the color selection and usage if you're trying to emphasize uh let's say if you're trying to group group certain categories together you can use one same color and also maybe like from here, I was, this is a, a map that shows a position of um, colonial, okay, colonial takeover. Yeah, so you can see in Uganda, it was the, the UK, the British. So it shows Uganda and Kenya were taken over, were possessed by uh, some, 
some centuries ago, yes, they were possessed. They were, it was a possession of the UK and the British. Then you can also see some of the countries like Liberia and Ethiopia were independent nations. And then these are Belgium, rather France. Yeah, so I'm trying to, here they were trying to group to show you to show you like the groupings can be with the same color and then you can just maybe show the different the different countries just by putting a black and white to add contrast to the image yeah so then another part of visual of visualization mainly is um, the colors you're using you mind the people who are really color blind Let's say you can't use red for water. Yeah, you like when you're trying to describe or maybe visualize water, you'd want, you don't want to use red. So that these are like the guidelines, like for water, you can use blue. If you're trying to show something cool or safe and then red, or maybe you're trying to emphasize something so you can use the reds, then plants for green and all that. Yeah, so. Uh, you use available space and proper scale. Then another thing is, um, yes, you may you may be trying to show, maybe trying your data set is showing some some insights, but also you have missing data. So here you, it emphasizes that you do not, you shouldn't uh, ignore the null values. Only you can, yes, you can show them, like you can see here the industries that are adding or losing jobs. This, this, visualiz this visualization was showing that under transport and wa warehousing, utilities, healthcare and social assistance, there was no data for that. So they go ahead and describe it down below that the data was with, sorry, that the data was withheld by the government. So, like same for here, the industries that contribute the most jobs, this data wasn't disclosed, meaning it's now, and then they are able to they are able to 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 show that this was not disclosed because of the government, and as long as you give a reason, yeah. So don't ignore the null values. Show it and know how to visualize. <coughs> Sorry, how to visualize it. Yeah, so um, you can also use text and labels to improve uh, interpretation. Yeah, so here it shows the average daily consumption per person in the year 1985. So these are the, this is the meat, the vegetables, the fruits. So you can, sh you can see uh, there was high consumption of meat, uh, beef, and then less of the turkey. Yeah, so, it, but also it's very descriptive that they added the words and also the, the, the numerical values on it. So lines cannot abstract points, labels and axes are, are not, oh, you, can, you may use the label axis or not. So use meaningful titles and be very descriptive enough. Yeah. So you can also balance complexity if the data is very complex, but also emphasize on clarity. What, like be very clear in your visualizations and show what you're trying to portray. So here was, uh, this is a visualization, visualization about the incomes and life expectancy. You can, you can see in Africa, Africa is the blue. So in Africa, the life expectancy is kind of between 60 and 60 and 70, but the, the income is quite low on the low end and then life expectancy for other, 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 sorry, other, the other continents is kind of high as they age. Yeah, so the income is quite high as they age. Um, so these are some of the examples of charts to use for visualization. You can use bubbles like before, as I was showing, and also you can use cutter plots if you're trying to 
if you're trying to uh, show relationships between variables, correlations, number, say if you're trying to, if you have category, uh, you have categories of data <clears throat> and you want to show it, so you can use the scatter plot and also the heat maps and connected scatters and all that. Um, these are the maps. You can also use maps. This shows uh, most, actually most cities in the world are tending to urban, like they went into urbanization. Most people are leaving the rural areas and going to the towns. So this shows 80 to 100% of people are, let's say, are going to the urban, like urban to the cities. Yeah. So still bubbles. This shows um, uh, this shows coronavirus as of March. Still, it shows around the European areas. There was a high. There were so many deaths at that point. And in Africa, you can see there were less, less, less uh, cases. Yeah. So these are back plots. Back plots are mainly for comparisons if you're trying to compare. Uh, now let's say we have we have these countries, Pan-Africa, USA, Canada, and France, UK. And you're trying to compare what do they what hashtags do they really what do they mainly hashtag to or why do they retreat or whatever. So they it shows that entertainment, um, Pan Africa is very good at, at hashtag, hash, doing the hashtags of entertainment and commerce. Then it shows on lifestyle. It's, uh, let me see, it's France that is high on that. Then commerce, it shows still France's hashtags are a lot about commerce. Then for football, you can see Africa, France, and Canada, and rather and UK are, are more on the same line when they're hashtagging, like hashtagging football, they're all on the same line. Yeah. So this is a word cloud. Word cloud is more like you're trying to find, let's say that trends, what's happening in a certain, in a set, I'll give an example like on Twitter, what's really trending, what are people talking about in, it, in this particular month or whatever. So um, this is the word cloud for, in, let's say Uganda, um, around when they were trying to lock down, people were talking about their children, medicine, hospital, how they're going to get food, um, the fees. Then you can see children really came up. Um, they're talking about schools, they're going to stay home, it's a problem. Yeah, so what cloud really describes what's going on in a particular time. So it's able to pick out all those, what are people talking about? Yeah, also, um, you can also visualize your data with a box plot. Now the box plot has, it usually shows the, per, the percentile, the percentile a method of graph graphically depicting a groups of numerical data through quartiles. Yeah, so this is like the low quartile and the high quartile. So in between here shows like the mean and the media median part of your where your numerical data lies. Yeah, so this is a box plot, then uh, the lollipop plot. Now for the lollipop plot, it's more like a hybrid between a scatter plot and a bar plot. Yeah. Then uh, density plots, you can use density plots. Now for density plots, they are more like representation of distribution of numerical variables. And also it's a smooth version of a histogram. Yeah, you can show, you, it shows here that in January of 20. 20, sorry, January 2013, there was low, people were not sleeping around January 2013. And around here in July, in July, 
So it also shows that these users were, were doesn't look like I'll be sleeping tonight. So these users were not sleeping around this month. Yeah. So these are the line plots. I think I talked about this below before. So line line plots are more like you're showing trends, maybe time, and then money, fluctuations, all that. If you're showing trends, you can use the line, the line charts. So they are stacked area plots, team charts, and all that. So uh, their network maps, I'll use like uh, Facebook um, or Twitter. You, you can, this is me, I have my friend. My friend is connected to this friend. Makes, that, makes me, makes this one uh, a mutual friend. So just like this one. My, um, this is me, my friend, they are connected to this other friend. So I'm a mutual friend. So those are networks, like what's around you and also who is a, who knows who, something like that. Yeah. So this is a code diagram. Now the code is, is a graphical, it, it, it's a graphical method that displays areas interrelation and interrelationships between data in a matrix. Now the, the data is, the scales are right on the edges of the circle and also the data points are displayed as arcs. So you can see the global mi migration kept on increasing with time in these years. Yeah. So some of the bad visualizations um, I think you can, maybe you can share with me in the chat. Yeah, which, which images do you think are quite confusing? Yeah, they're trying to say, have you ever liked a brand on Facebook? Most people are saying no, but then the, the, the image is, is not descriptive enough. Um, most people are saying yes, but then the image is bigger and the people are saying no. So you can see and tell the, 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 visualization, the visualization that is quite confusing. Yeah. And then maybe you can share with me which one is quite confusing. Yeah, so some of the bad visualizations. Now this, you're trying to show so much with so many colors and it's quite confusing. People may not make sense of, out of what you're trying to say. Then also for pie charts, keep it clean, keep it simple, and also let it add up. Yeah. You can see this is a bad, a bad pie chart, very confusing and also not as descriptive as you'd want to be. Um, tools and resources. So in, in when you're doing data analytics or data visualization, like when you're trying to do these visualizations, in data science, you can use Matplotlib, Digiplot, Seaborn. Seaborn has very beautiful graphs. Um, plot, plotly and all that. Yeah. So there's a chat doctor. It will it will show you. Um, let's say if you're doing if you're trying to do comparisons, what is the best chart to use? If you're trying to show trends or correlations, it's able to guide you on what to use. Then another thing, keep them clean, keep your visualizations clean and easy to understand. Also don't use so many colors. Yeah. So there are, there's Tableau, there's D3 and ggplot and others. I'm sure there are so many graphs and charts that I've left out, but I've talked about most of them. So, I'll leave you with this quote, less is more, keep it clean. Perfection is achieved, not even, not when there is nothing more to add, but when there is nothing left to take away. So, and, and this, this, this quote really describes visualization. And I thought I would share that. So I'll let uh, Claire and here we conclude the presentation with the part, practical part. Yeah, 
Thank you, guys. Any questions? Hello? Hello. Uh, Dorothy? Yes, yes. Um, Any questions? Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, there is a question. Uh, you mm -hmm. can open that Q&A. Mm -hmm. Stop sharing. Um, great, thank you. Great and insightful presenting. What's the rationale between behind data visualization? It's data visualization is more like you're trying to. It's really you're trying to um, you're trying to tell a story about your data. Yeah, so you're trying to tell us tell us to visualize what matters and make really great insights about your data. Yeah, great and insightful presentation, Dorothy. However, my question is, what are the tools and packages that can be used for inside the contemporary Python, Excel? So if you don't need to run code, Excel has the best, has some good visualizations. And so if you're not going to do to run code or use any other data science visualization tools, you can use Excel and so many others. I may not know, maybe you can help me in the, maybe people can also help me suggest. In developing an engaging and motivating learning system. Yeah, um, when, the when the vis I'll give an example. Let's say you're trying to build a system that shows that shows maybe uh, the deaths of people of coronavirus. So if you had all that, let's say if you collected all that data and you're able to draw, rather to visualize it and also understand it very well, you'll find some patterns and also find a way of making sense out of it so that you find the right way of tackling it. Or maybe if, if the data is showing that, oh yes, there was this pandemic and people have lost so many jobs and what, what not. So once you understand the data, it's able to help you maybe plan ahead and maybe do, maybe uh, do solutions to the insights you found in the data. Yeah, so once you have a good visual at visualize, visualized, if your data is visualized very well, it's able for your system to learn and even predict ahead. Yeah. So I hope I've answered all. How can data be visualized in video form meaningfully? Uh, I didn't add visual, visual, I didn't add the video format, but yes, you can you can you can do it graphically, and also you can do it in video form. Yeah, yeah. So that's it. I think I've answered most of them. Thank you, Dorothy. I. Okay. I think we can uh, have the practical session right now. And uh, like Dorothy has informed us that uh, the main purpose of data visualization is uh, basically around communication. So you have this huge data set, uh, for example, that you've collected on COVID. And it's sort of like uh, covering a very large area geographically. And it also has a, quite a number of features in there, right? But now let's say you've opened it in an Excel file, in a CSV file, 
in a JSON file. And, uh, and so it sort of like does not make so much sense, yeah? But if you visualize it, then you can make sense out of it, right? So you can tell the story and that is the whole purpose of data visualization. Okay, so uh, we're now going to go through uh, a series of visualizations, uh, here with and I, and, uh, and yeah. So, so here it will start uh, with the presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so my name is Hewitt Tusime. I will be taking you some, through some of the visualization. I am a third year student at Mackay University doing a Bachelor's of Science in Software Engineering. So let me share my screen so that you can view the notebook. Uh, kindly asking the host to enable me share my screen. Uh, and I hope the echo has gone. Yeah, it's better. Okay. I think you can share now. Yeah, I guess you can see my screen. Can everyone see my screen? All right. So good afternoon once again. Again, I'm here with Tusime. I'm going to take you through these visualizations. So like my colleague explained, and um, one of the sessions in the morning was telling us about pandas and Jupyter Notebook. So those are some of the libraries and packages that we shall need for the visualization. Um, so the packages for visualization in Python are Seaborn and Matplotlib. They do not uh, do different things, only that Seaborn is uh, an enrichment of Matplotlib. For other languages like R, you could use ggplot2, the gram of graphics. So this first cell in my notebook is basically importing the required packages for us to have the visualization. Um, I think we shall handle the questions or the, the questions in the chat later. But yeah, the notebook will be uploaded on the site. So like I was saying, uh, the first cell is basically all the packages that you need. NumPy, Pandas, Seaborn, and Matplotlib. So we're going to be looking at data on the coronavirus, the, co the global pandemic. And uh, my data has the following columns. I could just do a dot head for you to see what the data looked like. Yeah, so these are the different fields that we shall be visualizing. The date, the month, the day, the countries and territories. These are basically countries around the world. Some are referred to as territories. This is the country code and the continent. So we shall majorly focus on the continent, the country, the cases and the deaths, plus the deaths. So first of all, I'm going to take you through bar plots. So like my friend Dorothy, my colleague Dorothy explained, the bar plots are used to visualize categorical information. So 
they hope you have an insight of the data without me going to my data set and calculating how many total deaths did maybe say Africa have or Asia have. I could just visualize them. So um, this first visualization is a visualization on the different cases, total number of cases that were recorded in the different continents. That is Asia, Africa, America, Europe, and Oceania, all the, conti all the continents you can think about. The other continents are covered in this column called other. So we sort of do a group by on our data, we group our data in, in, in terms of the continent and find the total number of cases per continent. So this is what we visualize here using a bar plot in matplotlib. So this scale, as you see, this scale is not really informative. It doesn't tell you that maybe say there are 5 million cases or 4 million ca or cases under 1 million for Africa. So that's why uh, just in the subsequent cells, I will show you how you can make your visualization much more informative by including, say, the count on every bar so that your audience can understand what you're trying to portray to them. So like we, we saw here that other doesn't really tell us what continent is in this column or what countries are in this column or it's it's when I studied our data it it just shows maybe say people who are who got the virus while on water maybe they were out of the vacation on water and got the virus so that's what this other basically says and uh, here I eliminate this column called other just like uh, my colleague Claire had done in the morning we basically just eliminate other because it's not really giving us the right visualizations that we want. So that's this is just pandas and uh, manipulating our data to, to get what we want to visualize. So after concentrating on, on countries, I mean on continents that I want and eliminating other, we find the total number of cases in every continent. This is basically, I don't want to go through these lines of code because we are majorly looking at visualization. So I don't really want to, I don't think there's need to explain every line of code here, but we are just organizing our data to have, for your visualizations to make sense, you must understand your data and you must know what you want to visualize. Yeah, so you have to make sure that your data fits in the question you're trying to visualize. So here we just uh, concentrate on particular continents and the total number of cases they record. So this visualization is similar to this visualization above, but here's, here's what's going to help us tell the difference between matplotlib and Seaborn. So like you see, I am hearing uh, noise. I don't know if someone wants to speak, but like you see, this is um, a visualization thanks to Matplotlib, a visualization using Matplotlib, and this is a visualization using Seaborn. So just like uh, Seaborn, you pass, um, just like Matplotlib, you pass your X axis, which is the continent, and your Y axis are the total number of cases plus the data, our data set is called continental data. And this uh, parameter called hue, sorts of um, plots the data in groups. It groups the data per continent. So it allows uh, this sort of title. I mean, uh, scale is enabled by this parameter called hue. I could just remove it to show you the difference. So this is the plot without, or the visualization without the hue. So the hue helps me create 
sort of a scale. Yeah. So moving on, uh, my colleague talked about bad plots and good plots. So like we visualized here, we're using a bar plot to, to see the total number of cases recorded per continent. And here, if I decide to use the line plot, this is what the visualization looks like but it's really not informative because I just see a line and I see maybe Africa, America, Asia, and I can't really quite map this to a certain number with a scale, yeah? So here is when you realize that the bar plot would be a better visualization compared to the line plot. So you, you have to know, at the back of your mind, you have to know that your choice of visualization matters, your choice of the chart that you're going to visualize with matters. But uh, just, um, a better way you could, if you still really want to use the, the line plot, a better way you could, or something that you could add to help you visualize your line plot better would be other parameters in the plot. So if I could just comment this out and uh, show you if I add a parameter called marker and then I define the size of my marker and the color and you see what how it makes the plot better yeah so if our scale so this scale has uh, the cases are in terms of million yes so the fact that they're in millions uh, you can, I think you can see this that from here above you may not necessarily see the number very well on the scale here. So that's why also the scale matters when you're visualizing your data. So just to make the, to maybe enhance your line plot, you could just add something called a marker and then have it at different points on your scale. So this can help you visualize better. Uh, you can pass different things And sorry about that. Um, sorry about that, my internet got an issue, but I could share my screen again. Okay, so I was talking about, I was talking about enhancing your bar plot. So I was saying our scale is really not clear because the count is in million. These cases are counted in terms of million. So just to make your bar plot clearer, you could add a value count on the bar. Say if Africa has 400, 5,000, 500, um, 476,000 cases, you could just add a count on the bar by looping through. By using a for loop and then um, yeah so let me just comment out my for loop and I show you what it looks like so this is the original plot but now if I look through my x and y axis Sort of helps me add a count, yeah? So this can clearly indicate that the total number of cases that were in Africa were 405. 
without me having to change my skill. Yes. Um, yeah, other things you could do to your plot is say add a title, add a label for your X and Y, and these are the different ways you can do it. Say plt.title, plt.x label, plt.y label. So you can do this for all the different plots that you have. And uh, I think the I didn't show the part where I changed my plot, my bar plot into, into a horizontal bar plot. So this is just plt dot plot kind is equals to bar. So if I want to make it horizontal, I just make, I just pass it as a bar edge over here. So for your plot, of course, you definitely have to pass your X and your Y axis. That's maybe something that I had not yet mentioned. You need something on your X and, your, and something on your Y, just like any other plot would be. So um, moving on, these are some of the plots that I, in form of time. So one of the plots that you can use to visualize data that has an aspect of time is a line plot. So you want to see what's the change over a certain period of time. And uh, I guess this is a, the point where I need to give my colleague a chance to also go on and explain these other plots moving down. So I would like to hand over to Claire, I think we shall take the questions at the end of the session. She'll take us through the time series and uh, word clouds for text data. Okay, uh, I'm requesting the host for rights to share my screen. Billy? Martin, can you make Claire co-host? Seems like Martin is not around. He, do you have the Claire's presentation? You can show it and then she just speaks through it. Okay. Okay, you can go on now. Okay, uh, so moving forward. Yeah, uh, so we've looked at uh, quite a number of plots and uh, now we can uh, sort of like look at some of plots. Uh, so for example, if at all we would sort of like want to determine the number of total cases in each continent over time, okay? And uh, for example, we can sort of like think of eliminating 2019 
uh, since uh, from the previous tutorial, we actually observed that we only have a single entry uh, for, for 2019. So we thought of uh, dealing away with it and uh, by specifying that the, that, uh, the year that we're interested in is uh, 2020, okay? Yeah, so, uh, so for us to be able to, uh, first of all, find the number of total cases in each continent over time, then we uh, sort of like have to think about uh, using the group by method as we explained. And then uh, the best uh, way in which we can present this is using a line plot because it, it is a very good uh, for time, uh, for time sorry data or time analysis data. So uh, on, on our X axis, uh, we have the month and uh, this, uh, and the months have been uh, sort of like captured as numeric values. Uh, so whatever we have as one is January, then two is February, uh, three is March, April, May, June, uh, and July. Okay, and uh, so we can see the color coding is here uh, using this uh, particular hue. Hue is equal to continent EXP, and that means uh, that we are sort of like going to have different colors, but these colors are dependent on uh, the categories that we've captured under continent. Okay, so you can see that in the month of January and, uh, and February, most of the continents had not yet uh, registered cases. They had not yet registered COVID cases. Okay, and uh, so it kept on uh, moving. Uh, February, we had like uh, Europe coming on board with cases. This question? Okay, uh, so February, uh, we had uh, Europe coming in uh, with uh, cases. And then you can also see America on the rise as well as Asia or somewhere, okay? Uh, but for continents like Africa, we can see that we actually now started sort of like registering a good number of cases around April uh, into May up to June. But now after June, sort of like we've got a decrease and this is the same case with Asia and the uh, uh, same case with uh, America, so something like that on uh, via a line plot, yeah. And then we can also think about uh, maybe representing uh, information on more than one future at a go. And uh, for example, if you look at, th at this, this is sort of like a bar graph, <coughs> and it's basically depicting other cases and the death Okay, yeah, the cases and the death are for these uh, different continents. And uh, this is sort of like group, group by on a month level. Okay, so like we've noticed that we actually didn't have cases in January and February that like that huge number of cases apart from Asia uh, where, the, uh, where the virus came from. Still, we can be able to depict this here. And uh, March, we get to register a few cases and uh, uh, April, we get to register a few cases, something like that. So this visualization is uh, sort of like the same as uh, what we had before, but instead of having a line plot, we've uh, sort of like presented it uh, on a bar plot, okay? Yeah, and then this particular one, it's showing the number of deaths uh, that we've had. So you can see the scales are a bit different. Uh, the first one is up to a scale of uh, 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 slightly above 2.5 million uh, since the analysis is on a continental level. And then here, the scale is up to like 100,000 deaths. Yeah, so if you can see like in the month of April, Europe registered the highest number of death cases and it was uh, above 100,000, as you can see here. Yeah. And then America, so Euro much as Europe registered the highest number of cases in April, but we can see America, which is color coded as orange, has uh, sort of like registered a high number of cases of, uh, that is uh, from, from April. So you can see April, May, and June, it has registered the highest number of cases compared to other continents that are represented in this data set. Okay. Then, so maybe we can narrow down uh, our analysis on Africa, yeah, since 
uh, maybe this is data science Africa, we can sort of like look at what is happening in Africa uh, in regards to uh, the cases, the death, and so on and so forth. Okay, uh, so basically what we did here Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hey. Sorry, sorry. Internet is internet problem problems are real. <laughs> okay, so uh, I don't know at what point you lost me, but I I guess uh, the last explanation was around uh, these uh, graphs. So the first graph here, it's it's basically depicting uh, the number of cases. And uh, this number of cases have been grouped by month and also grouped by uh, by continent. So what are the total number of cases that uh, we had in each particular comp uh, continent, let's say in January. So you can see in January, we, we sort of like had Asia. Uh, and uh, uh, in February also had Asia. Then we had a few, con a few other continents coming on board in March. And, and so on and so forth. Okay, and, and, and then when it comes to July, sorry, when it comes to death, we can also uh, look at the number of deaths that have been re registered or reported across these different continents over time. And uh, the time that we're talking about is the different months uh, that are represented in the data. So uh, maybe to point out, uh, July is incomplete because our data was collected uh, uh, up to 1st July, or we fetched this data on 1st July. So it sort of like starts uh, from uh, the starting point when that country registered the first case up to 1st July. Okay, uh, so maybe we might not actually hinge our focus on July since it's not fully represented. But if you look at, uh, uh, let's say up to June, we can sort of see uh, that the country that has registered the most number of deaths is Europe, uh, which is above 100,000. Uh, and uh, yet uh, a, a continent, sorry, it's not a country, it's a continent. And uh, yet the continent that has registered the highest number over time is America, because we can see in April, it has a high number and in May it also has a high number and then also in June it has uh, sort of like that high value. So over time uh, America has registered uh, the highest number of deaths uh, for this pandemic. And then we went down to Africa. So can we sort of like maybe focus on Africa and see what exactly is happening in our continent uh, where the conference is uh, sort of like uh, burst from. So uh, in Africa, we looked at uh, the cases and deaths uh, and we grouped by uh, the countries in representation, but we narrowed down uh, to countries uh, whose cases are above, uh, above 10,000. 
And these countries, uh, we sort of like said that these are the most affected countries. So I want to sort of see that the countries which are most affected, how many deaths uh, do they have in terms of uh, number? And uh, to best represent this, uh, we did we did this on a, this is sort of like a combo chart. And uh, so what the chart is depicting uh, on the bar graphs, it's depicting the number of cases and, uh, and the line plot is depicting uh, the death. Yeah, so, so our most affected countries and those are countries uh, where the death is more than 10,000. So almost can countries, almost affected countries, that is Algeria, Cameroon, Egypt, Ghana, Morocco, Nigeria, and South Africa. Uh, South Africa and Egypt being on the lead, yeah. So we can see, we can sort of like see that South Africa has registered the, the highest number of cases, but it has also registered a very high value in regards to the number of deaths. And it's sort of like the same thing with Egypt. So Egypt, the cases that it has registered are lower than that of South Africa, but Egypt has registered the highest number of cases. Okay, uh, yeah, so uh, something like that. Then maybe we can look at the case of Uganda. So when we look at the case of Uganda, uh, the pandemic started in March, okay? And by the time we fetched this data, we had registered 19 cases in July. And uh, then we didn't have any death. Uh, I'm not sure if we have any, but uh, yeah, from uh, our data source, we didn't have any death then. So if we sort of like look at this uh, small data frame that we've extracted, we can't really do so much with death since it's a flat value of zero. So we sort of like are now focused on cases. Uh, since we can see, uh, we sort of like have different values under cases, okay? And uh, we represented this on a pie chart. So you can see that Uganda has registered the highest number of cases in a month uh, six, uh, that is June. And uh, uh, percentage wise, it's uh, represented by 51.4%. And this has been followed by May, by May and followed by, by, by April and followed by March. So it's sort of like if we if we if we ignore July since we're saying July is in conflict. So it's sort of like from March to June we actually kept on seeing our number of cases increasing. Okay, and we can be able to depict that on uh, on the pie charts as you can see here. Okay, uh, then uh, maybe this uh, last plot here uh, before we go into the tag clouds. So this last plot here is basically uh, to show us uh, scattered plots uh, whereby uh, the size of the plot is dependent on the value that it holds. So this scatter plot or this particular visualization is holding data from three different variables. So the first variable is x and this x has been given by uh, random by using this random method in numpy so that means it's sort of like generating any random values and uh, these random values are up to 50. for example if we, if we just comment out this so these are sort of like the values uh, that we're talking about so it's the same thing with y uh, we have random values are generated. Still, these random values are up to a length of 50. Okay, and uh, we have another variable here called sizes. So this variable is given by, uh, you get a number 20, an integer 20, you multiply it by the value, and then uh, the, the, the value that you get, you square it, okay? So when we when we when we get this data now and uh, plot it here in the scatter plot, so you can see something like that. So it's sort of like how uh, this very first is standing for whatever is uh, represented on the x-axis, okay? Then this is standing for whatever is uh, 
for whatever is what represented on the y-axis and then this is uh, for the sizes okay yes this a particular and then we have like different uh colors in there yes uh, so this is, is sort of like a scatter plot that we can think of and then uh this other parameter is basically for transparency uh the alpha parameter okay so let's let us uh, briefly go back to our covid data so we've we've seen that uh from this data set we had uh, different countries uh represented we had different continents represented etc and that was uh, a given data source that we are looking at but now we thought of like looking at uh another data source okay and uh, this is basically social media data so uh, we are not really going to go through uh, we're not really going to go through the entire analysis of the data but now we are basically going to see uh, okay So we're basically going to see that much as that reporting was ongoing on that given site, okay, what exactly was uh, happening, uh, let's say maybe on other, on other channels of communication, for example, social media, what was uh, really going on, okay? So if you look at social media data, it's another powerful data source, still without going into detail, because I understand uh, we have a theory on, on that particular topic. Uh, but like I said, it's a very powerful data source and it can sort of like help us to understand what exactly is ongoing. Let's say, uh, for example, if we look at the case of Uganda, what exactly is ongoing in the country or what exactly is ongoing uh, maybe in other parts of the world, okay? So uh, we went ahead to collect our Facebook data and uh, this Facebook data was collected uh, on Ministry of Health because um, because uh, this was one of our media channels uh, where this information kept on coming, okay? And uh, they kept on uh, reporting the death, uh, sensitizing the masses, among other things, okay? So if we look at social media data and then we visualize it, because we've said the whole point with visualizing is to communicate uh, is to communicate findings, is to communicate what exactly is sort of like uh, this data trying to represent. Okay, so we, we went ahead to collect uh, this uh, Facebook data on uh, various platforms, uh, giving an example of Ministry of Health. Uh, for example, if, if we look at, so it's really quiet, but let's say if we uh, briefly go, uh, where do I want to see? so if we briefly go in this particular uh, part, we can sort of like look at the most frequent words maybe that can be uh, for starters, what exactly are people talking about? So we can, we can see there was a lot of information on the word COVID, on the word health, then uh, 19 because this is COVID-19, and then definitely Uganda case, and then compound ministry today, and so on and so forth. So with our frequent, uh, with our hashtags included. But if we look at the hashtags, we can see that regardless of the fact that we had stay safe Uganda, we had COVID-19, but we also had net campaign featuring somewhere on a Ministry of Health uh, platform. Okay, so that could sort of like tell us that much as we have this ongoing, we, 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 we actually also have other, other topics, other interesting topics in the data, okay? So the best one of uh, the visualization the, that we can think of is, uh, is sort of like a tag cloud, yeah? And uh, a tag cloud will basically depict uh, the information in your data and this information is uh, depicted in terms of uh, like the larger the word that means that it sort of like has a higher frequency in the data okay so we can say that with this tag cloud 
Uh, we have uh, quarantine, we have COVID, we have ministry, we have case, we have confirmed health, Uganda, among others, are sort of like having, uh, uh, they're sort of like having the highest frequency. And, and you can see they sort of like, uh, they are bigger compared to the other words in there. Okay, so basically, how do you create uh, a, a word cloud? So what you do is uh, you sort of like have to, let's say first uh, collect your text data, okay? And then maybe you can think of uh, storing that data, for example, in a list. Uh, maybe you can also choose to have it in lowercase, okay? And uh, you can sort of like, do this so you keep on appending the words but at the end of the day you'd want the words to be represented in this uh, particular format the way you can see here so these all these are different words okay and this is uh, using this given j method and then later on you can create a separate file uh, where you can save that uh, that particular data okay so once you've organized your data in this format and you've already imported uh, your word cloud so this is also a package that is already in uh, Anaconda. Yeah, then you can go ahead and, uh, and, and create the word cloud, okay? By calling the method word cloud, you can specify a background color, you can specify these measurements, that is the width and height. Then the word cloud is going to be generated from, uh, so this sort of like generate, so it's going to be generated from this file, this particular file here, okay? All top 100 words, something like that. Then you can go ahead and, uh, so you can go ahead and show your word cloud using this. You can go ahead and eliminate the axis. Then you can go ahead and, uh, and you save the word cloud, okay? As an image. Then finally, you show it here. Okay, so let me just, show you a clear photo I guess okay so this is sort of like the tag uh, the word cloud that I was talking about and these are sort of like the top 100 words uh, for Minister of Health in March. So this information included the posts and the comments that came in up from the different people who commented in that particular period. And then we can see that, okay, that is information on March. Uh, yeah. But what if we go to June, what exactly changed in June? So we can see that in March, we had, yes, quarantine, we had ministry, we had COVID, etc. But now in June, we sort of like get more information. Uh, for example, you can see new words coming in like driver, because I think uh, that is the period where we had a lot of cases. And these cases are tr at the tr our truck drivers. Then you could hear a lot of new cases because, as you've seen, we we actually have had our cases on the rise from March to June, and I guess we are yet to make a compilation for July and see. Okay. Then you can see uh, other words coming in like number because at that time the Minister of Health kept on sharing uh, their uh, contact number where people could uh, reach them. Yes, then result, uh, positive. Then you can see also words like lockdown coming in. Yes, uh, because of uh, uh, the lockdown that we've been in, okay. Then you can also see other elements coming in like mojoga because of uh, various, uh, <coughs> because of various <laughs> elements that were ongoing in people's lives, okay. And because we know uh, that is the time uh, people are given food, that is the time uh, maybe we also had like some up uh, lifting coming up, yeah, but uh, st uh, strict measurements, but uh, <laughs> some things were lifted off, yeah, so something like that. Uh, so this is basically a word cloud showing us all this information. Now, maybe what if we think about uh, social media, sorry, what if we think about media houses? So the media houses I'm talking about are these different uh, outlets that we have. If we think about our local channels like CBS, like Simba, can we sort of like get the same conversation? You get the point? 
So when we did the same, we, we, we found out that, yes, much as COVID was ongoing, but people had like so many things that they were communicating about, because you can see Kabaka's uh, you can see birthday, then somewhere you can see Kabaka, but, but still you can see the virus somewhere, right? Uh, you can see things, you can see Bobby, you can see Corona. So you can also be able to see these different representations on uh, the same information. So you'll see some people call it flu, some people call it Corona, some people call it COVID, and so on and so forth. Okay? Y yes. So basically, uh, that is how the word cloud uh, comes about. So it helps you to visualize your text data and it can really help you what kind of stories are ongoing in the public or from whatever platform that you've collected your data from. Okay. Uh, yes, so uh, that, that marks the end of uh, the visualizations uh, that we, we packaged for you. Yeah, any questions? Thank you, Claire, Hewitt, and Dorothy. Please ask questions to the Q&A. There are a few questions there, if you don't mind taking a, answering a few, Claire. Okay, uh, I'm trying to use it and a chat. Could you share the DSA website, the notebook after? Okay, I think this is about sharing uh, sharing the, the presentation. Please, could you reduce the Zoom? How can data visualization help in developing and engaging and, uh, and motivating learning system? Okay, uh, yeah, so the question I can see here is how can data visualization help in uh, developing and engaging and motivating learning system. Okay, well, uh, one of uh, the visualizations that we can think about, and I think which could sort of be like part of your exercise, uh, since we have a day off in the summer school, uh, these are interactive visualizations. So interactive visualizations are, are sort of like engaging. Uh, so for example, if you, let's say like, if you have room where you can filter your data, uh, then that is the engaging uh, that we can sort of like think about. Yeah, so if we think of uh, like uh, interactive visualizations, then uh, those are very good uh, in terms of uh, engaging. Yes. Uh, then uh, Jonathan says, you didn't talk about heat maps and density plots, are they not so commonly used? So yes, they are very commonly used and we actually cannot exhaust uh, the visualizations that are there, right? Uh, but, uh, okay, since uh, the data that we were actually working with was not geocoded, that's why we didn't really go into the mapping. But yes, uh, the heat maps and the density plots are very, very important because they can sort of like help you to look at the concentrations uh, that you have in the data and also in uh, particular spots of the data. So in case you're doing research, do not leave them out. Okay. Yeah, then I can see Judd has shared a link to introduction to animation in Python. Thank you, Judd, uh, for the link. Yeah. Any more questions? Oh, okay, so you can't find the link. Uh, let me just paste it there. Yeah, there you go. Okay. So I guess if the audience is satisfied, uh, then we shall uh, conclude from here. Uh, thank you very much, Billy, for the opportunity.
Thank you, Claire, Dorothy, and Herod. This was fantastic. Um, we still have a few extra minutes if somebody wants to ask any last minute questions. This is the last presentation for today. Um, we'll compile the materials from today and put them on the website so that people can look at them before tomorrow. Tomorrow we start again the same time, 8 a.m. Kampala time with the anomaly detection. Uh, Martin, do you want to say any uh, last words before we discuss? Yeah, um, yes, uh, thanks, Billy. Um, maybe just thanking uh, the people who have, uh, you know, been able to, um, to join um, today's uh, sessions. And, um, you know, it's, it's good that, you know, they've been interactive and people are, you know, asking questions. Um, and, uh, you know, look forward for, for tomorrow. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So basically, that's um, uh, that, that's what I could uh, I, I, I would say for now. Uh, so there's a question, Martin. Somebody asking, can we view all participants tomorrow? Can I do what? Can we view all participants tomorrow? Is there a room to organize a short five-minute meeting, meeting where everyone can turn on the video, take a few pictures? screenshots and then we switch back to the webinar yeah so it will um, yeah so um i think the limitation is uh, i mean since we're still few uh, we could we could have that we can organize that that would mean uh, promoting everyone to to panelists and then um yeah i think it can be organized But we have to to think of when. I think Billy, we can discuss when we can do that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Probably towards the end of the summer school or something. Yeah, maybe towards the end of the summer school. Mm. Yeah. Well, thank you, yeah. everyone. I guess this is um, this is it. Day one. Let's see everyone tomorrow tomorrow morning or tonight, depending on where you are. <laughs> mm. Yeah, so I think, you know, keep safe. Uh, see you tomorrow. <laughs>